Greetings, everyone. How are you? Let me know if you can hear or see. Hey, Kate. That? And Nicole? Hold on. Good afternoon, yes. Start here in a couple minutes. Oh, thank you, Kyle. Appreciate that. I know last YouTube lecture, you get uh, at least one more in person tomorrow. Uh, have you guys set up a sign up sheet for that by any chance? Or should I have a Google one? Am I extra quiet? I haven't changed my settings. Turn my gain up a little bit. Aaron? Jessica? Yeah, Allison. Okay, good. Thank you, Isabel. Well, thank you, Abby. Appreciate it. I uh, made the brave venture out. I said my hair is too long. Looks too. I don't know. Not great. Oh my goodness. Well, I lost all my stuff. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, Alyssa. Alyssa. Okay, well, my window's back. Uh, yeah, so we'll do we'll do the um the Zoom tomorrow. So we'll kind of do it just like last time. I think I think it worked out pretty well. Um, but let me know if there's no sign up sheet. Otherwise, I I can like make a Google Doc and send it out to you, all in Canvas or something. Kelly. Turn off my fan so I don't sound so unprofessional. I'm gonna miss the zoom, getting my second shot right after class. I say I say go for it. That's that's it's fine by me. You can always catch back up later. Other one's like, yeah. Just remember, um you might feel a little crummy the next day, for sure. Okay, good. I'm glad you have the sign-up sheet already. Fantastic. I got a bunch of questions over here, so I can address those. Oh my goodness, I'm gonna have the window up. There you go, perfect. So that'll be at 2.30, so... A little bit later, so hopefully that doesn't deter anyone from showing up. But class will be had regardless. Ooh, sorry, Jackson. That stinks. You'd have to like take an exam with that on, on board. That'd be not fun. Um. So, Abby, I can at least speak anecdotally, at least from my close contacts and, and myself. I felt much worse after the second one, but it was like, at least with my experience, um, arm soreness was certainly. Um, you know, for a couple of days, my, my whole arm was, was fairly sore, but then like almost like 24 hours, like to the, to the minute, um, I had this like wave of like malaise wash over me and I was like, what does the malaise feel like? I, that's what malaise feels like to me now. Um, but, uh, that was, uh, gone. I, I took a quick nap, uh, and, and got over it pretty quick. So it's about a couple hours. I think I took some Tylenol and it was good. Yeah. Because, you know, think about it, too, like your immune system has now been at least somewhat sensitized to it. So you're having a much stronger reaction to that second dose. So that kind of makes sense why you'd be uh, having stronger reactions the second time around. Right. Yep. Fever, chills, fatigue, the works. Ooh. Didn't feel anything. Oh, the first, second really kicked her butt. Yeah, so at least, you know. You know, two weeks after, you're pretty much well protected for the most part, which is good. Yeah. So again, you know, everyone's reactions will will sort of uh, will sort of uh, vary depending on on you know their sensitivities and stuff. But that's funny. The constant hunger. At least you can like blame it on something. So if you feel like you know eat the whole bag of potato chips, you can say, "Well, it's the COVID vaccine, obviously." Alrighty. So it's twelve thirty. Let's answer some questions here on the board, uh, which don't seem to be uh, related to uh, vaccines at all, but are maybe related to our farm assignment. So 
Uh, someone's asking, if you're using Atomidate for RSI, is an opioid typically given in conjunction with it? Um, typically, no. So um, normally what you'll see, if you're going to use Atomidate, since that's your sedative, you'll give that first. Then you'll follow it up with your paralytic, either succinylcholine or rocuronium most commonly. Uh, and then uh, once they're intubated, if you want to keep them sedate, uh, you know, say you're transferring up to the ICU or um, they're going for a CT or whatever the case may be, um, then you can start up an infusion of a, a more long-term sedative, not like long-term acting, but just like they'll be on it continuously. Um, so either uh, like fentanyl versed is a popular combination. Propofol by itself, you may see um, those are the, the most common ones. Um, even sometimes I'll see... Uh, patients, if you just want to have like a nice light sedation, they may do like Presidex uh, in those cases there. But that's going to be for like the continuous infusion after the fact. Um, for the actual intubation itself, it's usually just Atomidate by itself if you're using that for sedation purposes. Someone says for number one, on the farm assignment, if we we're giving induction agent and a paralytic, for example, would we give instructions for if they weren't successfully intubated? Um, I'm going to have you just keep it simple, right? So I always say KISS, keep it simple, students. So just write for the one-time dose. Just assume it went well. Um, that way it kind of avoids complicating things. Um, normally what you would see happen, uh, and, and you'll do this a lot too. So normally if you were having to intubate a patient, you know, normally like a medical, like our size, like typically in like an emergent sort of situation, unless you're like, you're doing it planned, like in the OR or something like that. So in these emergent situations, a lot of times you may not have time to actually write your orders first. Um, sometimes you'll be calling out verbal orders that will be administered, and then you can go and backtrack it afterwards and, and put in the orders after the fact. So that way the nurses can document when things were given, uh, things like that. Some people are better about going back and doing that documentation. Some are worse, but that is typically the goal in a lot of cases there. So um, I would just keep it simple. Just keep it to the one-time doses there. Someone said, why are we giving a fluid bolus uh, for the farm assignment? Is this just for maintenance fluids while she's intubated? I'm not sure the reason why we're giving this. No, just, um, you know, a lot of people tend to benefit from a nice bolus of a fluid there. This person's coming in for a cocaine overdose and with a seizure. So, you know, um, could they have had like a lot of sweating? Could they have had some vomiting? Um, you know, it's just generally, you know, pretty common. They're going to get a fluid bolus regardless. So I would just, that's why we do it. So that's why I would say. Uh, let's see here. Does a patient in the farm assignment need pretreatment prior to intubation? It doesn't specify if she's bradycardic or has increased ICP. So if I didn't include it, then don't assume it's there. So if she doesn't uh, appear to have any need for uh, for pretreatment based off of what I provide, then don't give her any pretreatment, right? If I was going to be specific, I would have put that there. I'm said farm assignment. Let's say we pick ketamine for the sedative and we give the initial dose. Are you wanting us to also write for a continuous infusion maintenance dose or just for the four initial dose meds? Okay. Hopefully this makes sense. Thank you. Um, no, just write for the, the initial intubation meds, right? Um, I'm, again, I'm just trying to keep it simple. Just trying to have you guys think about how you're going to write these orders, how you might select a drug, one versus the other. So, uh, but again, think about things like ketamine. Like, is that good for someone who has a cocaine overdose? I don't know, right? But think about sort of the reactions there um, that could that could happen. So. Oh, no, someone, I missed a, someone, I think, removed their sticky note. I don't really know what, what that said. So hopefully if they had a, they can post it up if they have a question still. Anyway, uh, someone said, I understand how to use rapid sequence intubation, but I'm a tad confused on when to use it. When are we using it, or we are using it whenever there is trauma, like an MVA, and the patient needs to go, uh, needs to be put under to go to surgery. Um, lots of reasons why you might intubate a patient. Typically, if they are unable to breathe for themselves, uh, whether that be due to, um, you know, head trauma, whether it's due to medication intoxication, whether it's due to um, severe asthma, whether it's due to um, really, you know, seizures, like anytime that they're unable to protect their respiratory tract uh, and they are unable to breathe on their own, that's typically when we're going to intubate. And so, um, for instance, there's like a, a popular saying, they say a GCS at eight, prepare to intubate. So, for example, if people think... Um, Oh, good. I'm glad I already answered your question. So um, some people think if, um, uh, for instance, if your GCS gets down close enough to eight, you're, you're basically, again, sedate enough where you're not going to be able to protect your airway. That's when they go ahead and decide to, to intubate there. I always love, GCS is really funny too, because I like it when people who don't know what it's talking about, they said they had a GCS of zero. And I'm like, that's pretty bad if the patient had a GCS of zero. That's not even possible. But um, yeah, so lots of reasons why you might do that. Uh, sometimes it's done preemptively. Like if you kind of know a patient's going to be heading in the wrong direction, you can go ahead and do that beforehand. Um not super common you do that, but sometimes you can kind of see where the direction's heading uh, of the case, and you can say, okay, let's go ahead and intubate. Um, 
Other cases there, you can see um, in surgery, it's going to be much more planned because, you know, if you have like a planned surgery, then you can say, okay, we're going to do this. And in that case there, it's usually going to be much less of like an emergent situation just because, um, you know, it's something that's, uh, you know, if you're going back for surgery, hopefully you're healthy enough for surgery. Hopefully you're not going to have a lot of like anatomical issues to contend with, you know, versus like an R side, just kind of take whoever comes in off the street, basically. Uh, yeah, so a little bit, a little bit different in the situations there. Uh, someone said, what's the typical rate for an IV fluid bolus? Um, it, it can depend. You know, you may default it to running in over 30 minutes. You could do it over an hour. You could do it over five minutes. Um, it depends on how you're going to give it uh, to. So if you consider, for instance, if you're going to put like a fluid bag onto a typical pump, right? Like an Alaris pump is an example of one brand that we use. Um, that only runs at 90, 999 mLs per hour, meaning you could only really run that bolus in over an hour or if you're running it off the pump sometimes you need a lot faster than that a couple ways you can do that one you could apply uh you take it off the pump and then apply extra pressure to the bag so you could either do this with your hands if you were in a bind um you could do this with a pressure bag that looks like a um, almost looks like a blood pressure cuff that you can put over the the bag itself and it has like a little um a uh, little bulb you can squeeze to increase the pressure it's one way uh, sometimes in pediatrics, when we're trying to get a very specific volume, we'll do what we call the push-pull method, where we'll take a big 60 ml syringe, and we'll withdraw fluid out of the IV bag, and then push that into the patient. That's one way to do it pretty quickly. Um, or you even have things like, uh, there's something called like the level one infuser, which uh, is pretty cool, because they can do like a liter in just like a minute or two. Um, let's see, level one, that's, that's something you're gonna see a lot in, um, for instance, in like trauma centers and whatnot. So this is what um, that level one infuser would look like. So you could put like blood on there, you can put all kinds of stuff and that can run in uh, very, very quickly. So just in, ooh, and the rain's starting, so hopefully my power's gonna stay on. Anyway, so uh, yeah, that's how, that's how you can do it. A lot of different ways. Uh, see, if we are using Atomity, are we supposed to use an analgesic with it? No, not really, because um, Atomity is gonna be providing um, enough of a significant, um, uh, enough of a significant sedation that they're not really going to be feeling much of anything. They're going to be completely out of it. Um, and so you can get the intubation done. And again, this is not like as painful as something like, you know, like an incision you're, you're, you're doing or something like that. So um, typically you can use an anatomy by itself. Um, yeah, so someone's talking about uh, learning how to calculate an IV fluid bolus. Go back to your PEED section, right? Like the, the PEED stuff still applies to adults. Uh, typically 20 mLs per kilo is considered a fluid bolus. Um, that generally equals out to a, a between one and two liters for an adult. Typically, you cap it out. If you um, want to be aggressive, you can do two liters. If you want to be a little bit more, um, the standard approach is typically one liter. For an adult, it just typically depends on the case there. So. Um, but you can't go wrong with 20 mLs per kilo. Um, but if it's like, if it comes out to be like, you know, 1200 cc's or something, just I, I'm just gonna give a liter, right? Because that's the typical bag size there. Um, yes, uh, yeah, they, they, they don't warm the fluids. You don't wanna, you don't typically want worms in your fluids, but they do warm the fluids, which is important. Um, typically, you know, trauma centers and stuff can be a little bit chilly. And so if you wanna keep the patient nice and warm. Um, Two, if you think about like hypothermia, um, you know, you might think like that's not possible in Florida because like we don't have like, you know, very cold seasons and stuff, but it can happen. Uh, if you have patients who like, you know, run off the road into like, uh, you know, a, some kind of body of water or something, I've seen a few hypothermia cases from, from that standpoint. But anyway, wow, I think I answered all the questions. About 10 minutes there, it's not too bad. But let's get on with our PowerPoint over here. So we were talking about the the various... Uh, toxidromes um, that you can um, encounter. We, we went over things like the uh, opioid toxidrome. I think we went over that one already. Yeah, we did. Uh, we talked about the uh, sympathomimetic toxidrome. We talked about the uh, anticholinergic, cholinergic. So again, be able to sort of like look at a case to see what you know signs and symptoms a patient is presenting and be able to um, basically uh, you know, determine which one of those toxidromes they appear to be displaying, right? And and maybe if there's an antidote available, what, which one you might give for that potentially, right? Um, now, when you get into the sedative hypnotics, this is like a huge category. A ton of stuff falls under under this. So like benzodiazepines, all of your barbiturates, um, again, Fioracet or Betalbital, which is the barbiturate in Fioracet. That's probably the far and away the most common one you're going to run into on a, on a routine basis in patients, uh, muscle relaxants. So like all of your cyclobenzaprines, your flexorils, uh, um, baclofen, things like that, things like that, and even a lot of miscellaneous things. So for instance, like GHB, right? Gamma hydroxybutyrate. Um, this had uh, a bit of a, um, uh, 
kind of a notorious reputation for a while because of its use for for date rape. It was something um, which is now not available very easily, at least. But um, that used to be uh, kind of had had some pretty significant um, uh, you know links to that. Um, it was. Uh, profoundly sedating i mean and it's really wild the ghb too because you can have patients go from needing to be like intubated because they're so sedate they're just, they're just not breathing um and then when it wears off it wears off like immediately so you can have someone going from like intubated to like ripping out their et tube if they're not on continuous sedation uh because they wake up and, and just so so abruptly it's pretty wild uh, but certainly ethanol is going to be a common common thing you're going to see here and again you can see quite a combo here and again the the most common thing i always would run into for like kind of routine like accidental overdoses or intentional overdoses it was generally like an opioid there was a benzo there was a muscle relaxant and typically alcohol like that's like just like you know uh basically you know um, i think uh coma city basically you know in terms of like how sedating all this stuff can be together most of these set of hypnotics are all going to be working through the same mechanism. So they're helping to open up this GABA channel to allow for chloride to flow in. So everything gets hyperpolarized, everything slows down. So as you might imagine, you're going to see pretty similar side effects to what you're going to see with, um, you know, your various, uh, you know, anti-epileptic drugs. Uh, you know, we've already looked at a lot of these, um, but basically CNS depression is going to be the main thing. You typically don't run into a lot of respiratory depression unless you start to mix and match things. So for instance, I always was told, um, by some of my uh, my my superiors during my fellowship, they would say that the only way you could die from a, a strict benzodiazepine overdose was if you got hit with the truck that was delivering it. And kind of the point of that was saying that like you know the stuff is is very sedating, but typically the patient's going to keep breathing even if they have a very severe benzo overdose, of oral overdose. Um, however, a lot of them don't take it by itself. They will take combos of things, all right? Um, they'll take maybe whatever's at hand. Actually, I just had a case the other night um, where a, a young patient tried to harm themselves, and they took Seroquel, they took um, Propranolol, they took, um, what was the other meds? Tylenol PM, which is, you know, acetaminophen and uh, diphenhydramine. They took some melatonin just for a good measure. Uh, there's one other thing I think they took, but uh, certainly, right? So again, just all kinds of things together. And a lot of those can have sed sed uh, sedating sort of properties very similar to what you can see here. Um, typically, you'll find some mild G decreased GI motility, some maybe some hypotension, more so with the barbiturates. But again, overall, they're going to be very sedate, right? Uh, maybe not breathing. Um, some of them may have some anticholinergic properties that can sort of feed into that a little bit. So like cyclobenzaprine, carisoprodol, which is another muscle relaxant you may run into. Uh, that one's called Soma. That's its brain name. Uh, so you ever hear of the Soma coma, that's kind of where that comes from there. Um, how we're going to treat these patients, uh, the ABCs are very important. So airway, breathing, circulation, which I'm sure you're learning about from Professor Q. Um, airway management is very important for these patients here. So if you need to intubate or provide some sort of um, uh, airway, you can do that. Uh, if they are hypotensive, we can provide fluids. We can also do pressors if need be. So like uh, norepinephrine uh, is most common uh, for a lot of talk stuff. I, I recommend it most commonly. Uh, dopamine you could use, you know, things like that. And then in terms of antidotes, really the only thing we have here is going to be flumazenil, right? And this is specifically for uh, benzodiazepines. So if you have someone who has overdosed on like alprazolam, diazepam, anything like that, flumazenil will reverse that, right? Um, you want to be really careful with this. And I rarely ever recommend flumazenil to patients or, or my, on my consults uh, because of the fact that if those patients have been on a benzo for a long time, uh, they have sort of that chronic sort of um, you know, physical adaptation that occurs there to where their body's just used to having that effect on all the time and you take that away, it's very likely you can cause a withdrawal seizure. So, you know, if I have like a little kid that accidentally gets into the, like, you know, grandma's, you know, uh, Xanax, uh, that's no problem because it's a single time ingestion versus um, someone who, um, you know, has been taking clonopin regularly for years. You try to reverse that, you're going to have a bad time. So severe withdrawals, maybe even seizures, right? Uh, in terms of enhanced elimination, I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, nothing specific here, but like phenobar, for one example, you could do um, something called urinary alkalinization, where you actually give bicarb, sodium bicarb, to increase the patient's urine pH to a point where they can actually clear more quickly. It has to do with uh, modifying the, the charge on the drug to make it um, less likely to be reabsorbed from the kidneys, basically. Um, and I'll talk about charcoal here in just a little bit as in, ter in terms of uh, decontamination. Uh, withdrawal also counts as a sort of toxidrome that you can run into. So someone who um, is uh, been cut off cold turkey from their medications, or maybe they have like a drug interaction that's leading to this withdrawal phenomenon, will present very much like a, um, uh, usually the opposite of whatever their normal substance would be causing. So uh, for instance, like cocaine withdrawal looks a lot, a lot different than withdrawal from opioids or benzos, because again, those two are sort of opposite in terms of their actions there. 
Uh, Matthew's saying, uh, someone took all the sedatives and you need to intubate. How does that change your intubation meds that you give? That's a great question. Um, so if they are so sedate, especially from drugs already, that um, they are not providing um, any sort of like resistance in terms of like, you know, being able to get that airway, you may not use anything. Um, so it's not... We don't do it commonly because I think, you know, some people still worry about maybe some residual uh, consciousness there. Um, but in some cases, if they're so sedate, uh, they may get intubated with, with just nothing, right? Or just maybe the paralytic in some cases there. Um, so, yeah, that, that can can occur. Um, I say just, you know, if you're already intubating anyway, what's a little bit extra like accommodate on top of whatever else, it's probably not going to cause any problems. So, uh, and you're better safe than sorry, I think, in, in those situations. They're a little more humane, I guess. But, um Anyway, so if you have someone who's like withdrawing from like opioids or sedative hypnotics, you're going to see a lot of anxiety, agitation. They're going to feel miserable. Um, they may have a lot of GI hyperactivity, so like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea for sure. Um, again, withdrawal seizures are possible with a lot of those meds like you know, your benzos, barbiturates, things like that. Um, but things like opioids, not fatal if they're withdrawing. They're going to be miserable, right? And they'll let you know about it, but they, that's not fatal, right? Um, let see. That's what I'm saying. Uh, someone said, so what do you give if there's a, a chronic benzo user that's overdosed on it? You just support them, right? So uh, I always talk about the tincture of time being one of the best antidotes that we have. Um, you support them through it. So if you need to intubate, you, you keep them intubated until um, they are able to clear that drug out uh, and then can kind of recover on their own. Or if they're just like, you know, they're just hanging out sleeping, give them maybe some, some O2 via nas nasal cannula and their entitled CO2 looks good. Like, yeah, just let them sleep it off and that, that may be fine. So... Um, really just depends on, on the situation there. Anyway, um, right. So again, key exception said if Nogs withdrawal seizures, you want to be really cautious with that. <laughs> Someone's, uh, where can I pur purchase this tincture of time? I need more hours in the day to study. Unfortunately, I am all out. I'm out of that time to give, unfortunately. Oh, man. It does fly, though, doesn't it? It's like with kids. I don't know if uh, I know some of you uh, know this, but they say like the the days are long, but the years are fast. I can't believe I already have a five year old almost uh, on my hands. So it's pretty pretty wild. But anyway, so let's talk a little bit about um, patient assessments here. Now you guys are experts at patient assessment, right? You know how to do a physical exam. You know how to take a good history. These are some things I kind of think about when I'm uh, evaluating a patient or someone's giving me uh, a case uh, to sort of evaluate and determine what we need to do. And again, you got to know what, you know, kind of things to expect from certain ingestions um, to see whether it's consistent or not, right? So if someone tells me they overdosed on a beta blocker and they come in tachycardic, I'm going to be kind of eyeing that as, as a little bit uh, uh, sus, as some of the kids say. Uh, it's a little bit suspicious, right? So you may, may want to think, okay, maybe something else is, is going on there. So in terms of bradycardia, things are likely to cause this include like your beta blockers, your cholinergic agents, because again, they cause increased activity on that on the um, those muscarinic receptors on the heart to slow things down, your non-DHP calcium channel blockers, clonidine, digoxin, right? So if someone's coming with bradycardia, there's a reason for it. You just need to kind of figure out what it is, okay? And these are kind of common medications that, that can do that. Uh, someone said, with opioid withdrawals, what would happen if you gave a very small amount to help them? Well, that's how you treat opioid withdrawals, actually. Um, you know, you think about uh, things like uh, treatment programs, right? And just like we, we went over the, the PAEA stuff uh, we did earlier in the semester, um, that's kind of what um, you can do with like methadone and buprenorphine, right? So if you get like your X waiver um, with your, um, after you do the mat training and all of that, once you're on rotations and you get that uh, DEA license with the X waiver, you can prescribe buprenorphine for, um, uh, patients who have opioid use disorders, right? Uh, and so basically by giving buprenorphine, it's a, a partial agonist of those receptors. So you're able to sort of um, to give them partial effects. That way they don't get like the full effect of like doing heroin or, or oxys or something. Um, and that allows them to sort of slowly taper off of the dose over time. And again, the reasons, a lot of times the reasons why they fall off the wagon and they relapse is because of the withdrawal feelings that they get. They feel so miserable. Um, I was just watching a, a video of a, of a recovering pharmacist um, who had a uh, terrible opioid addiction. Uh, I mean, he's stealing from work from years, and they finally, um, he was caught. Um, but uh, basically, he was saying, you know, when he was going through, when he went to rehab eventually, and he was going through through detox, um, he was like, yeah, if there if there was a, a needle of heroin right next to me, he'd, he'd never done IV IV drugs, it's all oral stuff. He said, yeah, if there had been a needle of heroin right there, I would have I would have made it work, I would have made, made it happen, because the withdrawals are so severe. So if you can help to ameliorate those, or at least mitigate them to some degree, with a partial agonist like buprenorphine, that can help that out. So that's that's kind of uh, the name of the game with uh, opioid use disorder treatment. So very good thought. <clears throat> 
Um, things that cause tachycardia are pretty, uh, pretty uh, common things you can see here include your sympathomimetics. This includes all of your amphetamines, cocaine, et cetera. Anticholinergics, quite common, right? Um, so as, as an example, when I was talking about that case where the person had taken sertraline, um, Seroquel, propranol, all of that, you know, I would expect to see tachycardia due to the anticholinergic, to terminal PM as well. It has diphenhydramine. But then she also took a beta blocker, right? So do they balance each other out? I don't know. It's still pretty early on in the digestion, but I would be expecting either to occur there. And it would make sense based off of what she took potentially, right? Other things, you know, iron ingestions, um, uh, salicylates, uh, antihistamines, usually your first gen ones like we talked about, uh, neuroleptics, like all of your antipsychotic drugs, very, very common to see that. So a lot of reasons why patients may be tachycardic. In terms of hypotension, a lot of similar drugs to what we saw with the uh, with bradycardia, but more specifically, we can see calcium channel blockers, clonidine. Um, your TCAs like amitriptyline and whatnot are pretty notorious for doing this because they have some alpha blocking capability there. Um, Salicylates, so iron, digoxin, a lot of things can do this. Hypertension, typically due to um, some pathomimetics and anticholinergics, um, but even things like nicotine, caffeine, especially if you have someone who is ingesting a whole lot of caffeine. Uh, say, for instance, you know, they... Um, were studying for an exam and they they took an extra no dose or something on top of their 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 venti uh, Starbucks coffee like yeah they're going to be they're going to be hypertensive to some degree at least above what their baseline is um, but even thyroid supplements too right you know if you imagine someone taking an overdose of uh, levothyroxine about a week or so you'd expect to see their blood pressure go up uh, because of that. In terms of changes in temperature, you don't see a lot of things cause hypothermia. If it does, it's typically due to the fact that the patients were like exposed or they were like laying out in the middle of somewhere uh, for a while there to where, um, you know, they were just exposed to the elements and they became hypothermic. So you can see it was like carbon monoxide, you know, someone... Um, uh, you know, was exposed to that, like, you know, via a car or something like that, opioids, um, not, not real common. Hyperthermia, though, you do see quite frequently, especially due to, like, um, sympathomimetics, anticholinergics, salicylates, all those typically cause um, their temperature to go up. Imagine if you see, like, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, um, you know, uh, malignant hyperthermia, uh, serotonin syndrome, all that stuff leads to hyperthermia. So, again, um, good reasons you can be looking for that as well. Uh, Matt's saying, how does iron and aspirin lower blood pressure? That's a great question. So, um, Basically what happens, and so they, they have different mechanisms, um, but they essentially help to, um, one of the ways they do it is because they decouple oxidative phosphorylation, okay? What that means is, is that they are able to basically get into your cells and they keep your mitochondria from utilizing oxygen in order to produce ATP, right? Um, so what happens when that occurs? Well, just like if you're, you know, someone was asphyxiated or something, like they develop an acidosis, they tend to um, start to have their pH lower because they're switching to anaerobic metabolism. They're producing lactic acid and all kinds of acids like that. Thus, they get acidotic. What actually happens, though, is when you become acidotic like that, you know, proteins are generally made to stay in a certain conformation at a certain pH, right? Um, if you modify that pH to some degree, you can find that the, the proteins themselves can shift and they can kind of change. Um, one thing you'll see with a lot of your... Um, um, you're like your adrenergic receptors, like alpha one receptors, they become less responsive to catecholamines like norepi or epinephrine as your pH gets lower and lower. So you'll see this too in sepsis as well. Um, whereas as patients become um, acidotic, um, they don't respond as well to things like pressors, which is why it's important to try to correct that, that um, pH and get it back up to somewhat normal. Um, yeah. So you can, you can definitely run into some issues like that uh, from, from that standpoint. Um, yeah. It's a good, good question. Anyway. Um, Things that can affect your respiratory rate or the depth or rate of respiration. So with bradypnea, you can see things like clonidine, opioids, sedative hypnotics. You're typically going to see that. Again, it may not just be the rate of their breathing, but it could be the depth of breathing that is insufficient, right? And so you can see things um, to where um, that, that's why entitled CO2 monitoring, I think, is really helpful because that tells you even if they're breathing at a relatively normal rate, like say 12, 14 times a minute, um, that CO2 might be building up. And that is a good way to, to see if they're not breathing sufficiently. Um, with tachypnea, you see things like salicylates can do this. It can kind of stimulate your respiratory drive, so it'll become tachypnic. Um, you'll see this a lot with like irritant gases. Um, so for instance, if you were breathing in like, um, say you mix bleach um, and, and um, uh, bleach in an acid or something like that, you know, uh, or bleach and ammonia is a common one. You'll, you'll see there like when people are cleaning uh, their, their bathrooms or something and they'll mix bleach and ammonia. Um, 
they can then um, cause irritant gases to be formed, called chloramine gas, uh, and that will irritate all the, the respiratory tract and then causes to kidney, right? Because you're coughing and breathing faster. Uh, cyanide can do this too. Um, again, you might not think cyanide as a very common exposure, um, you know, unless you're dealing with like, I don't know, spies or something like that. They have like cyanide in their fake tooth or something. Um, but you can see this a lot in, in structural fires and things like that. So if you like synthetic um, fibers and like, you know, couches and things like that in the house fire, they can, they can release cyanide gas, which is not great. Uh, someone was saying, how do thyroid meds increase BP? Well, you know, just like you would see with a patient with hyperthyroidism for any other reason, typically you see higher blood pressure because again, your metabolic rate is going to be higher. Um, you're typically in a more sort of a sympathomimetic sort of state. So kind of think like thyroid storm, thyroid toxicosis, those patients are typically hypertensive tachycardic. And this is kind of the same reason because you're putting them into a state where they have more T3 available. So um, let's see here. So uh, other things on the physical exam that can be really helpful here, if we can look at the pupils to see are they meiotic or midriatic, right? That can kind of tell us a clue in terms of what might be likely to be causing the, the thing we're seeing here. Um, for meiotic pupils, you typically see like cholinergics can do this, clonidine, your opioids. Again, you don't always say with opioids, but you can. Uh, a lot of sedative hypnotics, right? It doesn't have to be pinpoint, right? They're not always that, but they can certainly be um, uh, much smaller than you would normally expect. For mydriasis, and this can be pretty stark when you see it, someone who's uh, had like a recent, you know, cocaine ingestion or, or anticholinergic, I think those big saucer looking pupils, which is pretty, pretty wild. Um, a lot of anticholinergics and antidepressants can do this. Sympathomimetic, anything with any, this anticholinergic can do this basically, but uh, also your sympathomimetics that are kind of increasing that sympathetic uh, uh, drive, like cocaine and amphetamines can do this uh, as well. So again, if you see those big saucer like pupils that you want to be thinking is this list of meds here. Um, if I see a patient is having a lot of sweating, I want to think about things that are putting them into a, a more sympathomimetic state. So things like cocaine, amphetamines, as I mentioned, but also things like organophosphates, right? Um, if you imagine uh, the, the dumbbells, remember sweating was on there. So it could be very diaphoretic uh, in that case. Um, Silicates can do this too, because again, they're making you more hyperthermic. So your body's trying to get rid of that extra heat by, by um, uh, sweating. Um, sometimes you can find dry mucous membranes, and this is typically seen with anticholinergics. Um, they may also be holding on to a lot of urine. So if like you cath the patient, all of a sudden you get like two liters out, that can show you they have some urinary retention due to anticholinergics there. Um, flush skin, right? If someone comes in with like bright cherry red skin, what could be causing that? Well, things like carbon monoxide and cyanide could potentially do this. Normally carbon monoxide isn't, they always talk about that in the books, but it's normally a post-mortem finding, which is um, hopefully you get your patients before that. What do you think of like boric acid? This used to happen when um, uh, people were, they would use like borax, which is like kind of like an old school clean, cleaner. Um, this happened a lot more in the past where uh, patient or people like parents would be cleaning baby bottles out with borax. They wouldn't wash it out or something. And then they put like milk into it, give it to the baby. All of a sudden the baby gets really flushed. They had this like red lobster looking sort of appearance. Um, they don't look like a restaurant, but they get very flushed um, uh, lobster looking appearance. Uh, and that was related to that. So again, that could be something that you can expect to see. Um, and then bulleye, this is going to be more so for patients who are like passed out for a long period of time. Um, they're normally like, you know, on the floor, for instance, or that, that pressure contact can cause that. And you can see that with a lot of your sedatives, but barbiturates are particularly known to do that, carbon monoxide, things like that. Um, so with seizures, so if you have someone who has an unknown, or a seizure for an unknown reason, you always want to think about medications as possible being one of the things that, that has causes or some sort of substance. Um, there's a big mnemonic here that I like to use called Otis Campbell. Um, again, I'm not going to be, unless I've talked about it elsewhere in terms of causing seizures, I'm not going to be like cherry picking stuff off this list necessarily, but these are things you can kind of think about and is a handy mnemonic to keep in mind just to kind of run through the list to see, okay, what's, what could be causing this seizure here? Um, so Otis Campbell, again, we love our mnemonics, so hopefully you appreciate them as well. Um, uh, but organophosphates, your TCAs, uh, isonides is actually an interesting one. So if you had like, uh, say a patient, um, who was found, maybe they are unhomed, uh, and they had history of TB and now they're having seizures could be related to isonized, right? Um, insulin can do this, right? Because it can cause a hypoglycemic seizure because your brain is out of energy and it, it can end up causing a seizure to occur. Uh, sympathomimetics for sure much like our, our case in our uh, prescription assignment with the cocaine overdose. Uh, camphor, which is something we used to find like in mothballs, but we don't use it quite as much anymore, but it helps make our mnemonics. We keep it on. Uh, aspirin, amphetamines, methylxanthines, that includes theophylline and caffeine, right? So it's not uncommon to see uh, severe caffeine overdoses can lead to seizures. 
uh, PCP, which is fencyclidine, uh, or angel dust. You don't find it too, too often anymore, but still something to keep in mind. Uh, benzodiazepine withdrawal, ethanol withdrawal, lithium and lidocaine. So just by going through that list or looking at their medication list or maybe what they've been exposed to, you can try to figure out, okay, could this be um, something that is related to the medication? Because if you can rule that or if you can you know, find your smoking gun here, then that kind of um, like keeps you from having to do a lot more legwork to see you know, what could be causing that. Uh, in terms of uh, odors, sometimes odors help us to determine what's going on with the patient, right? Um, and so you can kind of see the list here um, looking at, uh, for instance, like bitter almonds. We like to think about things like cyanide, even though genetically a lot of people are not able to smell bitter almonds, which is kind of interesting. Um, things like garlic may be indicative of arsenic. That's why a lot of times if you're trying to like murder someone uh, and you want to uh, have it be undetectable to the person, you put arsenic into their spaghetti sauce because it already has a lot of garlic on it anyway. Not that I'm advocating that. Don't do that, right? But it's something um, you may see like on The Sopranos or something maybe. Um, mothballs, like a mothball smell, um, uh, is typically related to camphor. Um, chlorohydrate can smell like pears, which is kind of interesting. Uh, a big one that I can still see sometimes is things like uh, methyl salicylates or like oil of wintergreen um, uh, will contain a lot of salicylates too. And again, it has that very sort of um, a noticeable sort of spearmint wintergreen sort of spell, smell there. And then um, rotten eggs, if you ever smell rotten eggs, you should be really careful because it probably means there's some degree of sulfur around and things like hydrogen sulfide can be um, uh, problematic there. Hydrogen sulfide is really interesting um, because um, I don't know if you guys know this, but like in Japan, there's a fairly high suicide rate. And one of the ways that they were doing this was they would actually have like their cars and you can find pictures of it. It's kind of wild. Um, but people um, will have their cars and they're completely taped up. Uh, they'll have every single, you know, um, your window taped up and everything like that. So this uh, and they'll basically mix um, uh, a sulfur based compound with an acid and it produces hydrogen sulfide. Uh, and it has a really rapid knockdown effect, meaning like as soon as you start to breathe it, until you get a decent exposure, like you're basically, basically out because uh, the stuff is so toxic. And they would kill themselves this way, but they would put up signs on the cars that say, like, do not come near here, hydrogen sulfide. Um, so that way, if people who are responding, like EMS personnel, they would not accidentally be exposed to it as well. And then you, all of a sudden you have two patients or more, right? Um, so fortunately, we don't run into that too frequently, but anytime you smell rotten eggs, you should be very cautious or clean out your fridge, one of the two. Um, another really handy one here is going to be wide anion gap acidosis, your WAGMAs, right? Uh, Jackson said, I remember this. We had to be briefed on for EMS in case we saw it. Yeah, uh, I don't know of too many cases here in the U.S., but it was something uh, that was a little more prevalent in Japan, uh, or at least that's where I first heard about it at, which is, uh, again, um, Unfortunate due to their you know, high, high suicide rate. But anyway, uh, reasons why you might have a wide anion gap acidosis. You probably know this one already, but it is your mud piles. Or I like cat mud piles because it includes um, some additional uh, things on here that I like to think about with uh, toxic ingestion. So uh, methanol, which you will find in your uh, windshield washer fluids, that can be paired off with ethylene glycol. Uh, which is typically found in radiator fluid. Um, these two here, you see a lot more in colder climates, like up north, you see a lot more ingestions here, but you can still find pretty easy access to it here um, down south. Um, you know, especially for patients who are um, have alcohol use disorders and they cannot get access to um, their normal alcohol, this might be a decent option, they think, right? Because it'll certainly get you drunk, but it has a lot of other really nasty toxic effects, which I don't have time to get into. Um, Actually, it's kind of interesting because up north in places like Chicago and, and New York would get, would get really cold. Um, the treatment of choice for um, toxic alcohol ingestions used to be IV alcohol. We used to give ethanol IV to treat that. Uh, and so it was, it was pretty wild because you'd have these um, uh, these people who were unhomed uh, and it gets, getting really cold. And so they didn't want to be left out in the cold. So in, you know, they typically had some alcohol use disorders as well. So I'd say, hey, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to drink a whole bunch of windshield washer fluid. I'm going to then go to the ER. Yes, uh, yeah, methanol can make you definitely go blind. It forms uh, formaldehyde and formic acid, uh, and it can uh, affect your optic nerve. Uh, so you get that snow field sort of blindness. That's classic for methanol. But anyway, so they drink all this stuff. They go to the ER and say, hey, guess what I did? I drank a whole bunch of methanol. They said, oh, boy, now we got to treat this. So basically they get a, uh, a stay up in the ICU. They have IV alcohol drip to keep them drunk, so that way they wouldn't form these like really nasty metabolites. Uh, get three square meals, have a nice nurse come take care of them, it worked out really well for them. Nowadays, we don't do IV alcohol anymore, so maybe they have a little less incentive to do that, but that's uh, been, been reported. Um, other things include uh, uremia, which we can easily pre, pre roll out with looking at the um, uh, basic metabolic panel, diabetic ketoacidosis, right? So you can look at their glucose. 
Uh, Proudahyde, again, this is another thing we keep on there just because it keeps the mnemonic working. Um, although Proudahyde, I don't know that I've ever encountered it. I don't even know where you find it. It just It's not something you run into very often. Um, isonize it or iron uh, can certainly cause this. Uh, really anything with patients having prolonged seizures and, uh, again, maybe they're not uh, breathing well, this can certainly lead to an acidosis. Uh, lactic acidosis itself, things like metformin, for instance, could do this. Um, I mentioned ethylene glycol and salicylates. I like to add on uh, the cat, where you, this includes things like cyanide and carbon monoxide, which you'd run into like with uh, house fires and things like that. Um, alcoholic ketoacidosis, which you can find kind of like a long-term um, uh, patients with alcohol use disorders. And then toluene. Toluene is a really interesting one. Uh, I have a, a, not a personal case, but I had a really interesting case I ran into. Uh, this is normally found like in paint thinners. Uh, and we had this gentleman who um, had showed up uh, to basically we, we were doing rounds in the ER one day uh, and we had, you know, we normally are like in the more kind of uh, emergent, you know, the sicker patients areas when we're doing rounds. Uh, but there's like a fast track area that a lot of, you know, there's kind of on the opposite end of the, the area. And so we had this resident come up and they're like, hey, can you come check out this patient? Um, he came in because he was hit with a shopping cart in a Walmart parking lot. Um, and he had ended up having a femur, or not femur fracture, he ended up having a hip fracture. So he's going to be admitted for that. So they decided to do a, a set of um, labs and turned out he had this like really big, wide anion gap metabolic acidosis, right? His anion gap was, you know, Greater than six, I don't know what it was, maybe the 20s or 30s. And they were like, why in the heck is he acidotic, right? He got hit with a, a shopping cart. It wouldn't make sense for him to be acidotic because of that. So we did some uh, fact finding. Uh, and this was a, a gentleman who had, had some pretty severe, um, you could just tell something wasn't right with him. Just the way he, he was talking, um, just he could not communicate well. He wasn't really a, a no times three necessary. We're like, what is going on here? Turns out, the reason why he was in Walmart in the first place is because he went back to the hardware section and found some paint thinner and was huffing this toluene to, in order to get high. Um, and so this is something he chronically did. You know, of course, he's stumbling out of the Walmart, gets hit with a uh, shopping cart, and then boom, now you have your hip fracture. So kind of incidentally, we ended up finding this uh, and it was related to that paint thinner. We saw him several times for very similar things, unfortunately. But anyway, um, and then we have some radio opaque agents um, that you can find potentially on things like x-rays, right? So these are things... Um, that uh, are typically going to be metallic in origin. Um, I actually, I probably should have put a picture of Phoebe's uh, little boppy pen. Uh, that would have been uh, certainly a good good option to put there if I thought about it. But um, the mnemonic we use for this is going to be chipes. Just doesn't sound like it makes a lot of sense, but we use chipes. Uh, this includes chlorohydrate, which again you don't find too often anymore, but a lot of heavy metals. So if you had someone who ingested um, any sort of like lead or um, uh, iron-based products or anything like that, um, certainly you can run into. Uh, you'll see that on the X-ray for sure if it's large enough. Um, iron, phenothiazine, so like a lot of your antipsychotics can sometimes show up. Enteric coated products uh, will sometimes show up, and then a lot of your like your salts, so things like potassium may show up as well. So you can kind of see some pills. Uh, sitting here in the stomach. Um, I don't know, did I ever show you guys the, I need to find this one picture uh, to, to show you guys something, but um, anyway, I'll, I'll try to talk and, and look that up at the same time. But basically, um, what you're going to find here is that um, you want to be careful. If it shows up, that's great. And kind of, you know, say, okay, well, I see this stuff on here. I know, I know this is what it is. I know, I know that's that. But um, you want to be really careful because of the fact that uh, if you don't see something, doesn't mean that it's not there. Um, so as an example, I had a patient who um, had uh, was coming in complaining of uh, basically you know stomach pains, nausea, vomiting, um, and she unfortunately had actually overdosed on aspirin or um, uh, sorry, iron on, on iron uh, tablets, uh, which can be very dangerous. But normally it takes you know some time before that's going to be an issue, like you know maybe you know 12, 24 hours. Uh, but she was coming in pretty early, and so her boyfriend had told her to come in because they're, I guess they had an argument. She had uh, taken all the iron, but then um, she went ahead uh, and came in, but she was lying. She she didn't want to disclose the iron ingestion, just said she was having nausea vomiting, right? So anyway, so the um, she said, oh, it might have had like an extra, you know, um, a tablet or two of my multivitamin, you know, it had some iron in it. But anyway, so she went ahead, uh, they took an x-ray and unfortunately did not find anything on the x-ray. So they went ahead and decided to discharge. Uh, unfortunately, the patient came back like 12 hours later. She was like severely acidotic, very, very sick patient. Um, and unfortunately ended up doing okay uh, in the end, but it was uh, something that could have been caught earlier and that would have been very helpful uh, because it would have uh, been able to initiate, you know, antidotal therapy a lot sooner there. I'm trying to find this picture of a nice heavy metal ingestion, but um, oh well. 
too bad. Let me keep going here. Um, so, right, so those are things that could be radio opaque potentially. Uh, so let's talk about decontamination. What can we do for patients um, that have had one of these toxic ingestions? Is there anything we can do to try to prevent um, further injury from happening or maybe prevent any kind of side effects from occurring in the first place? I'm going to talk, kind of talk about your dermal ocular decontamination and get into some of the GI stuff here briefly. So with dermal decontamination, this is really important and something you might practice if you're ever a part of like a mass casualty event or if you're participating in a mass casualty incident, like something happens where there's like a mass chemical exposure or something. Um, this is where you can do uh, decon here. Really, really important to make sure that whoever is doing the decon is protected as well because you don't want to accidentally have someone else become a patient now. Um, and in fact, we would um, do in our exercises, we'd have um, volunteers that would come in to be decon and they would have um, like marks on them. They have like, you know, some marks that would pretty easily wash off. But if they missed them, they got into the hospital, then that would be considered an exposure to the healthcare workers there who were just wearing scrubs. Uh, and they and they would be, be uh, dinged for that, unfortunately. So make sure to remove any like contaminated clothing. Typically, you're stripping them down naked and, and making sure to get into all the folds and crevices and everything to make sure there's no further exposure happening there. Typically, we either use like water with uh, plus or minus soap. You can add, add some soap that helps to get rid of a lot of like lipophilic stuff. Um, uh, dil diluted bleach solution can be used as well um, in some cases to help uh, you know, make sure to get anything off of there. It could be, again, more lipophilic in nature. Um, in terms of ocular decontamination, this is really important because, again, the eyes are very sensitive. Time is tissue. You don't want to cause any permanent uh, damage or blindness. Um, so if you do have an exposure, and I'll give you a really good example of this. And, again, kids are um, uh, kids are not always the, the most intelligent ones out there. But uh, there's a case where, um, you know, this was up in Duval County, right, where I was doing my fellowship. Uh, and these two kids were uh, out in, you know, kind of on the west side of town. It's pretty... Um, pretty, pretty redneck for the most part. Um, and so they were playing outside and they didn't have any balls to play with. So they took an empty bottle of Drano and they were passing it back and forth to each other. Well, what happened? Bottle uh, cap came off and ended up splashing one of the kids in the eye with Drano, which is very, very caustic. So immediately went into, had, had horrible pain. I uh, was coming into the ER and we needed to flush this kid's eye out to make sure we got the pH back up to uh, neutral uh, to make sure there was not going to be any kind of long term or damage being done. So a um, couple of things you can do. One is you can try to do, um, you know, f normally we'll recommend like flushing at home with tap water. Um, with kids, though, it can be really tough, especially if they're writhing in pain to, for them to be uh, compliant with that. So sometimes we'll do uh, like a papoose and kind of wrap them up into a little burrito and try to do it. Um, you know, uh, we can also do things like uh, hooking up a nasal cannula to an IV back and placing that over the bridge of the nose. You can actually just run um, normal saline uh, over the eyes, um, and that actually can can be effective too if you're uh, not like maybe in the ER itself. Um, also, it's kind of cool is this thing called a Morgan's lens, which I would never want to have um, uh, applied to me, but can be used. And basically, it's like a contact lens with this little tube off of it that you could hook up to a bag of normal saline, right? Which is isotonic; it's good on the eyes. Um, and uh, basically you would anesthetize the eye with like some tetracaine or something, place the Morgan's lens and then run the fluid uh, for, you know, maybe 15, 30 minutes that you can use a pH strip and check to see, you know, what the, if the pH is, is around 7.2. Um, uh, again, so that can be done. Um, and the example of, uh, had it had uh, with no tetracaine really isn't that bad, but it's really cold. Interesting. Yeah. I could certainly imagine that. Um, again, I just, I don't like eye stuff, so it kind of bother me. Yeah, so we tried to use anesthetic, but again, this kid here who had the, the Drano in the eye, I mean, in the PDR, it was just like, just nonstop screaming, the kid would scream bloody murder, and just like, what's going on? Uh, and then all of a sudden, like, the screaming stopped, and we're just like, what the heck happened? Why does the kid stop screaming? Well, it turns out they gave him some ketamine to finally, like, chill him out so they could actually do the flushing uh, in the first place. So again, that's a case there where using some uh, procedural sedation was very useful, because they would make the patient a little bit more compliant with our, with our therapy there, which is kind of interesting. Um, the next you have Ipecac. Let's talk about our GI decontamination. So the first one here is Ipecac. Uh, if anyone's seen the, the Family Guy clip, um, uh, this is uh, basically what happens. This is a very strong GI irritant um, that will cause uh, very vigorous vomiting. Uh, fortunately, we don't really find it available anymore, but I still mention it because people always ask the question, like, oh, should I give my, my kid Ipecac? They accidentally got into an extra, like, you know, Flintstone vitamin. Um, and no, and actually, in general, we don't recommend any... Um, uh, any sort of vomiting, induced vomiting, right? Um, so yeah, so it, it, any that you find is typically homeopathic, right? So there's no uh, specific uh, Ipecac product you can buy anymore. And the reason for that is, is because it was being abused by uh, people with eating disorders. So like for instance, like with bulimia, they'd use it to help them uh, purge. 
and uh, yes, who, who wants chowder? Uh, but uh, so basically, they would actually end up finding that one of the products in the Ipecac uh, caused cardiomyopathy. So you'd have these like patients who are, like really thin because they're bulimic, uh, and then it also had these like massive hearts because of the cardiomyopathy they developed there. So it, because of that, it was not recommended. The other really big thing that I, I try to tell people um, is if you ever have an accidental ingestion, don't uh, uh, induce vomiting because of the aspiration risk. Oftentimes, aspirating all that nice GI content is going to be worse than whatever they actually ingested in a lot of cases. So I don't recommend that. They always talk about, oh, we're going to, are going to, you know, uh, or I'd have people call up and say, oh, I tried to stick my fingers down their throat. I said, stop, don't do that. You know, uh, generally it's going to be a lot safer to, to not uh, induce vomiting there. Um, yeah, so that is a really big thing and, and it's not available anymore. So if anyone ever asks, you can say, well, we used to use it, but not anymore. Uh, another thing you could potentially do is gastric lavage. This is something where basically you can infuse um, volumes of water or saline or something down into the GI tract. Then you can try to basically suck it back, uh, back out. Um, the goal being to try to prevent anything from getting past the stomach and trying to re, you know, absorb it before, or try to uh, suck it out before it could be absorbed basically. Um, the challenge with this is, is that a lot of stuff just didn't really work or work for it because you'd have this, you know, big, like, um, I can't remember how many French size tube, I don't know if I put it on the slide here, but it's a fairly large tube. It's like a small garden hose. You'd have to be placing, um, uh, through an NG tube, right? So place an NG tube, uh, and then you try to suck the stuff out. But it, honestly, if it was like too big, it wouldn't be able to go through any of the holes on the tube. Um, a lot of things would, um, it'd be too late. Typically, you want to do this within an hour of the ingestion because after that, most of the stuff is past the stomach. But it really, is not going to be recommended in a lot of cases. And most of the time, people have not practiced it to even know really how to do it in an effective manner anyway. So again, this is not typically recommended, but they say, oh, are they going to pump my stomach? We typically don't recommend that for the most part, unless it's like a really like potentially life-threatening ingestion uh, and they're within one hour. That's the only time we'd really ever do that. And again, I, I don't recommend it hardly, hardly ever, to be honest. I don't know if I ever actually recommended it. Um, again, contraindications here, uh, if they're an aspiration risk, or typically if they are able to protect their airway, uh, we may need to do it for them. For instance, we might need to intubate, um, anything that is like corrosive or like hydrocarbon based. So things like, you know, um, turpentine or gasoline or anything like that. If it gets aspirated, that can cause a lot worse damage done to the, um, to the respiratory tract. If anything burns on the way down, it's going to burn on the way back up too. If you think about acids or, or bases. Um, so we don't recommend it for that. Um, any foreign body ingestions, definitely don't recommend it for that because again it can worsen the obstruction and then any toxins bigger than the lavage tube if you think about like a big iron pill or something it's not gonna be able to get through a lot of those um uh, the holes in the tube for, and for the most part just because it's just too big right uh, matthew's saying my vet told me to give my dog hydrogen peroxide to induce vomiting because he ate a sandal uh is hydrogen peroxide ever used in humans um good question yes that is commonly recommended for uh animals to try to induce vomiting uh, we don't do it for people uh, because of the aspiration risk. And then also what we found in studies, um, even with forced vomiting, you only get about 30% return on your investment, meaning what they actually ingested, only about 30% comes out. So, you know, could that make a difference in a life-threatening sort of standpoint? Perhaps, but it's just not really recommended ever. Um, and uh, hydrogen peroxide itself can be irritating to the GI tract for sure. It can cause um, corrosive injury for using like more concentrated forms. So typically don't recommend it for the most part. Um, hydrogen peroxide is really interesting. If you find like really um, concentrated stuff, sometimes you'll find like at like natural health stores and things like this, um, they can actually cause uh, big gas bubbles to form and can lead to uh, things like, you know, uh, uh, strokes and, and things like that, but not, not typically like your household stuff. Anyway, uh, but again, complications here, possible aspiration, maybe esophageal perforation. Uh, but again, that's pretty un uncommon for the most part. So um, what I do recommend, actually, uh, I just recommended this just the other day, is activated charcoal. This is the most common form of GI decontamination we do. Um, basically, activated charcoal has um, been uh, treated with heat and pressure to cause it to break down into this like really, really tiny particles. And so it has a massive surface area. So the goal is, is to try to combine with whatever medications or substances they got into, and it basically will just coat it and prevent it from being absorbed. Um, and that way you can just poop it out later. And so it uh, can be really effective if done within the right time frame. Typically, this is within one hour of ingestion, okay? Now, if they come in and they say, oh, I don't know when the ingestion happened, then don't give it, right? Because it probably is more than an hour. Uh, they say, oh, it was within, you know, uh, it happened at four o'clock and it's five o'clock now. I may still give it occasionally, but usually within the golden hour is the most important thing. Most of the time, you're not gonna catch people in that time frame. 
However, I just had a case uh, the other night to where the patient had ingested, um, that was that one, one case where I mentioned like the sertraline, Seroquel, propranolol, um, Tylenol PM, and all that. And it was like, it was within an hour and a half. Now, because they had ingested an anticholinergic that slows down the GI tract, we have a little bit more time. And so we ended up giving that um, and, and uh, kept the patient from ever becoming symptomatic in the first place, which is great because we caught her so early. Um, typically, we do a dose of like 25 to 50 grams. I'm not going to ask you. Uh, doses on the test necessarily, but just for your information, and you should do about a gram per kilo in peds. Um, uh, I wish I could give you guys samples because it actually tastes really good. It's very sweet, um, but it, the texture is quite gritty and it will stain your mouth pretty bad. Um, some people even like will like brush their teeth with charcoal. Um, you know, it's to help out with with whitening and things like that. But uh, on the stuff we give is actually uh, tastes not too bad. Uh, sometimes we'll give it like in a covered cup. Um, that way you can drink it through a straw because it makes it a little bit more tolerable. Um, so if you don't see it, because the stuff looks pretty nasty, it's like pitch black. All right, it's good to know what stuff does not bind to activated charcoal. So these are things I could ask questions on the exam. For instance, like which one of these things would not bind to charcoal? If a patient had this type of ingestion, what type of GID contamination do you want to do, right? Um, alcohols, heavy metals, um, iron, lithium, hydrocarbons, none of this stuff is going to bind to charcoal. It's not going to do you any good. So if someone said, oh, they ingested a whole bunch of, um, uh, for instance, you know, lithium pills, not going to do charcoal, not going to work for that. <laughs> Brian said charcoal toothpaste or grind away your teeth. Don't use it. Um, I'm way ahead of you. Not, not using it at all. But uh, yeah, I just know some people have used it. But yeah, I guess uh, I guess it's not recommended. Uh, one out of one Brian's does not recommend it, right? Um, anyway, so contraindications here, aspiration. If they have any intestinal obstructions um, or corrosive ingestions, definitely avoid this as well. And again, the time frame is really important. If it's within an hour or if it's within two hours, if they had an opioid or an anticholinergic slowing down the GI tract, you can use it there, okay? So, um, next up, let's see here. So we're going about an hour so far. Um, uh, one thing we could do is call whole bowel irrigation. I think I've mentioned this before, but basically we can use polyethylene glycol uh, or go lightly, the big, you know, four liter um, uh, containers of, of polyethylene glycol to try to flush out the GI tract. Um, this is good for things that don't bind to charcoal. So for instance, like heavy metals, if you have a body packers or stuffers, and what I mean by that are people that are either, uh, for instance, like uh, transporting drugs across borders. For instance, you had someone who's traveling, like say from South America to the U.S., uh, with a whole bunch of like packets of cocaine or something in their GI tract, this could be used to help flush that out, right? Uh, and to prevent them from you know, breaking open or something. Um, that's a body packer because they're packing up to go on a trip. Body stuffers are typically people who are uh, maybe they're using drugs or dealing drugs on the street. They see the red and blue lights and so they freak out and they don't want to get rid of it. So they and then ingest it. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it, I had a case just recently uh, where a guy got into a motor vehicle accident, but then found this stuff on the on the uh, X-ray. It looked like he ingested some uh, uh, cocaine that was in a you know, kind of a poorly wrapped. And so again, I always wondered was the car accident due to the fact he's trying to get away from the police, and he ingested that in order to get rid of the evidence. Who who can say? But uh, we had to have the question: Do we do whole by irrigation for that type of patient there? Uh, someone said, is charcoal staining the teeth permanent? Not to my knowledge. Uh, not that I'm aware of it. It does wash away eventually. I'm sure there's maybe some rare cases where that could happen, I suppose. Uh, there's a fat with charcoal ice cream or other charcoal flavored desserts. Could that bind to medications someone takes and make it less effective? It could. I think so. Um, I don't know how much charcoal is in there, um, but certainly, um, you know, I've seen like dietary supplements that may be like based on charcoal because, you know, it'll bind up toxins and things like that. Um, you know, that could certainly uh, interact with their medications as well. Again, another reason why you always want to ask like, okay, what type of um, you know, food do you eat on a routine basis? What type of... Um, uh, you know, dietary supplements to use and things like that in order to to figure out there could be some interactions going on there. Very good thought. It definitely certainly could. Um, anyway, so again, we do this for other things like uh, sustained release products. Like they have like a bunch of um, you know, XL formulated like you know, uh, you know, wrap mill or dotizum or something like that. You can try to flush it out sooner. Or if you have like concretion, so basically you can form uh, form what we call uh these bezoars. Right, so there's different types of beets, or you may have like a, a pharmacobezoar, which is like a like a mass of medication. You can see it's aspirin sometimes. Um, we can use to try to flush that out uh, more quickly, so that way it doesn't absorb. Um, basically, you start at like half a liter per hour, and then you work them all the way up to flushing it's about two liters an hour. Um, and sometimes we'll do charcoal first, so we call that go darkly sometimes, so that way you can kind of see when stuff starts coming out. If you see the charcoal starting to come out of their um, rectal effluent, then you know, okay, yeah, thing, stuff is moving through. That also helps to bind up anything that might have been might be amenable to charcoal. But the goal is to have clear rectal effluent, everything flushed out. Now, this is um, 
not done frequently because it is logistically quite difficult because one, you have to have a patient who's actually going to do this, which they'll say they'll drink it and if they're uh, willing to, but they oftentimes won't because again, imagine drinking two liters an hour of anything. Um, uh, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a problem there. Uh, Marley's asking, has it tried with trichobezoars too, right? So it would be hair-based uh, bezoars. Um, I don't know if they've tried it with that specifically. I don't, I'm don't. i trying to think what else they use. I don't know a ton about other types of bezoars necessarily, but uh, at least for the pharmacobezoars, we do that. Um, but I don't know. I'm sure there's an up-to-date article that could probably illuminate us on that. Um, but again, you know, this stuff tastes like warm sweat because all the electrolytes that's in it. So a lot of people don't don't stick with it. So that's why you have to do an NG tube most often to get it down. Um, I had one lady though that said, I, "I promise I'll drink it." We were doing it for a lithium ingestion, and and, and bless her, she she got two liters of it down uh, before she she gave up. But uh, yeah, most people don't even make it that far because it just kind of tastes pretty gross uh, to to a lot of people. Other things, make sure you uh, check for placement of the NG tube because uh, otherwise, if you start to instill go lightly into the lungs, you're gonna have a whole. A lot of uh, ARDS to deal with on top of whatever ingestion they had in the first place. Uh, Someone said, besides opioids and anticholinergics, what other drugs would activated charcoal work for? For other classes, uh, made it seem like activated charcoal wasn't used much anymore. That helpful overall. It binds almost to everything, right? So uh, if I had someone who had a cocaine ingestion, um, you know, we can do charcoal for that. Uh, if we had someone who really anything that wasn't on that list, if it's, you know, uh, medication based or like, you know, sometimes we'll even do it for like plant based ones. Um, we can do it. The trick is the reason why it's not used frequently is because of the time frame. You know, if someone comes in three hours after the ingestion, then it's not going to do you any good. Um, so again, if I have a good story, if it's like a kid who uh, was witnessed the ingestion or if it was like impossible for it to be more than an hour, uh, I recommend it. Um, with, with some regularity there. Um, but uh, a lot of times if it is, um, if they're an aspiration risk, uh, due to like, you know, CNS depression, or if they are outside of the time frame, we'll do it. So if that example I told you with the uh, sertraline, Seroquel, Tylenol PM, et cetera, um, you know, I, I, so I was saying, okay, well, one, what, what time do, do we think the ingestion happened? They said, okay, we think it's 5.30. I think it was like seven at the time. So yeah, we're within the, the time frame because she had an anticholinergic on board. And then I was asking, well, what's the patient mental status like? Is she awake and alert? And, you know, uh, and they said, yeah, she's completely asymptomatic right now. So that's a good candidate. If it was someone who's like, she's already like really drowsy. She's kind of passing out and nodding off when I'm talking to them. That's probably not a good case there. Or if we, for instance, like anticipate someone's going to have like a seizure or something, usually a lot more symptomatic by that point anyway. So uh, that, that is um, uh, how we typically use that. Uh, anyway, so, okay. So now I want to go over a few specific um, common drugs you're going to run into because, um, again, it's good to have at least some knowledge on this. A lot of times, you know, I still tell people to call the poison center because, one, um, it helps out with uh, from an epidemiologic standpoint. So that way we know kind of what um, uh, trends we're seeing out there. So that way we can look to see, like, are there, like, new common things that are happening? Um, or if you just need extra help, you can always call the poison centers. Does anyone know the phone number? If not, it is 1-800-222-1222. Very easy number to remember. Um, but anyway, yeah. And again, like just as an example, like for instance, when the, um, when the bath salts were starting to become a, a big deal, I was still in fellowship. Uh, and then, uh, basically I remember getting like one of the first phone calls our center got regarding, uh, something called white rush at the time that fell into this bath salt sort of category. Um, and because we were starting to get all these calls coming in, we could try to triangulate kind of where we we're starting to see, um, these, these cases happening. We can sort of like let other healthcare providers know that, Hey, there's this new thing that's out there. It could cause these problems. So it, it's really helpful. So I always recommend people call it the poison center. Even if you know what you're doing, just report the case because it helps us out uh, from that standpoint. So Tylenol, why do we talk about Tylenol? Because it is so common. Most people probably have Tylenol in their homes. Some people might have used it today. Uh, it is very easily available. You can go to a, um, you know, it's like you can go to the grocery store. You can buy a whole 500 count bottle of Tylenol. No problem. No one's going to bat an eye at you, right? Uh, but also can be quite toxic, as we'll see. And this can either be due to intentional ingestion. It can be accidentally uh, in, uh, ingesting too much, maybe due to uh, different pain medications the patient's taking, right? So what is the problem with Tylenol? You already know the liver damage that can happen, but why does that occur? Well, Basically, you exhaust your liver's ability to metabolize acetaminophen into safe byproducts, right? Normally, it undergoes a couple of different um, uh, metabolic pathways. So, for instance, it can undergo glucuronidation. It can undergo sulfation. And that normally is going to be the lion's share of metabolism. Some small amount of it can go through CYP450, so 2E1 specifically, and get turned into this metabolite called NAPKI. NAPKI itself is normally metab or then gets further metabolized through some kind of other conjugation, usually glutathione conjugation. Uh, but 
if you take a whole bunch of this stuff and you exhaust all these other pathways here because you use up like all your glucuronide or your glutathione or your sulfation uh, pathway, um, eventually you just have a whole lot of this napkin being formed here and this stuff is really toxic. So this is what causes the liver damage that you see with acetaminophen poisoning. Um, it can also hurt the heart, it can hurt the kidneys, it can do lots of stuff once it gets out of the liver. But initially, you're expecting to see um, uh, liver damage first, okay? So, um, you'll start to see this once you start to deplete that glutathione conjugate or that glutathione pathway. So about, you know, once you're less than 30% of your normal stores, you'll start to see this develop. And, you know, if you think about it, normal therapeutic dose of Tylenol, it's about 10 to 15 milligrams per kilogram. You can get probably up to around 75 milligrams per kilo per day and be okay. Once we start to get up to the 150 to 200 milligram range, that's where you start to get into trouble. Uh, so you can start to form a higher proportion of that napkin that you just can't get rid of and cause all the cellular damage. That produces free radicals, which can cause further damage to proteins and DNA and all kinds of things. Uh, and so, again, it's not just the, the liver. It's going to be the kidneys, the heart, the brain that can be affected as well. So uh, people who are predisposed to toxicity are typically those that are using frequent dosing. If they're using excessive doses, and so this is a really common uh, thing that I have to intervene on in the hospital is people are, get too aggressive with their acetaminophen dosing and they um, will do, you know, uh, 15 mg per kilo Q4 hours, and that's too much, right? It's just it's over that 75 mg per kilo per day. Um, chronic patients with alcohol use disorders, uh, if they have any induction of CYP2E1, which can happen due to alcohol, uh, or if they have just decreased glutathione stores in the first place, these are all people who are more likely to develop Tylenol toxicity. So um, I'll give you a really good case to go along with this that kind of demonstrates this. So I had a guy who was, um, I think he was like a graphic designer or something, and he ended up losing his job. Uh, and he was uh, really worried about providing for his family. He was really depressed. And so he decides he was going to kill himself. Um, so he ended up taking a uh, just a whole boatload of Tylenol. He said, all right, you know, this is easy to get hold of. I'm going to go ahead and take this. Okay. Um, and so he went to sleep that night. And he assumed he was not going to wake up. He said, I'm just going to go nice and peacefully. All this Tylenol in my system. Um, and again, initially, that all makes sense. Because initially, it's really... Um, it doesn't cause a lot of issues. It doesn't cause a lot of symptoms that during the first 24 hours. Because this first stage, there's no hepatic injury. You're kind of working through all those um, pathways until you can start to form that napki. Um, and a lot of people, besides maybe some nausea vomiting, it's it's asymptomatic, right? This is why it's so dangerous too and why we always check for it because you can have a patient who is really Tylenol toxic and they look totally normal. And unless you check for it, you'll never see it until it's too late. But um, anyway, what you're going to see, though, is that with um, what's happening in the background, you're forming all that napki, and it can lead to this more severe stages. So you're normally uh, around uh, hour 24 to 36 is when you start to see the transaminases start to elevate, so alt starts to go up. And then eventually what you can run into is actually developing things like higher bilirubin levels, you start to develop lactic acidosis potentially, and the PTINR is one thing that we really look for, right? It's funny because we say liver function test and we look at the ALT and AST, but they don't really tell us how functional the liver is. I look at PTINR. If the liver's not working, you're not producing clotting factors, and thus your PTINR is going to go up. So um, what was interesting is this guy was basically, he woke up the next day and he said, wow, I'm looking good. Like nothing happened here. Uh, I, I guess I must have been um, destined to live. So he goes to the library later on, goes and looks up Tylenol poisoning because he's interested. He's like, why didn't I you know, die during the night? Uh, and he realizes, oh, crap. This thing takes 24, 36 hours before you start to see a problem. So he was not, he was delayed probably about 48 hours before he came to see us. And he was already um, a shade of yellow. I don't think I've ever seen another person in my life. If you've ever seen that movie Sin City, there's a guy that was like kind of uh, very yellow. He was almost that yellow. Oh, not quite, but almost. It was, it was uh, just how jaundiced he was. And so we'll start to see that that's going to be a problem because um, early treatment is going to be preferred. Uh, someone's saying the daily limit for acetaminophen is less than 4,000 milligrams or 4 grams, correct? Yeah, it's usually recommended uh, for some patients who have like maybe history of liver disease or something like that. I may recommend even less, maybe like 3 grams or something. Uh, but yeah, for typically for adults, 4 grams a day is recommended. So um, then that's when we get to stage 3. So by the time we got to this guy, he was already kind of coming into stage 3 where you start to have this further increase in transaminases. I mean, you're talking about like tens of thousands in some cases. You can find the ALT and AST. Sometimes we'll get so sick that they have no more 
liver enzymes to to release into the bloodstream and then you start to see the lfts go down and you're like wow that must be really good he must be recovering well no it's just because the liver is so fried that it has no more lfts to, to even release there or, or no more ast alt so if you see the pti and are still climbing but the liver function uh, the alt ast dropping that's not a great sign and this guy had that going on there um fortunately did not develop any renal failure but you can certainly see that it can develop uh, hepatic encephalopathy metabolic acidosis and typically they're going to die it's going to be in about three to five days so not a good way to go. Uh, however, we do see it quite commonly, unfortunately, or it's a common co-ingestion to sort of complicate the picture in a lot of cases there. And then if they make it through all that, or they got like a transplant or something, then they go to this recovery phase and you'll see the LFTs will stay high for quite some time, but it may take you know, a couple months before they completely resolve there. Um, and yeah, so Looking at this again, um, with patients who have maybe like tried to intentionally harm themselves, um, you know, you can't really trust the history in a lot of cases. So you always want to check because the fact that it's asymptomatic, right? If someone says, I did a whole bunch of cocaine and they don't have like elevated blood pressure, heart rate, their pupils look normal, I, you know, I don't necessarily believe that. But if they had ingested cocaine, like you can tell, right, based on their uh, toxidrome. Acetaminophen has no toxidrome. That's why we have to uh, check on this stuff. And that's why if you ever have an overdose case or you're suspecting an overdose, you always check a Tylenol level regardless. Okay. Uh, I, I usually don't tell you always, but in this case here, you always do a, a acetaminophen level. Again, if I had a call, say to the poison center and said, oh, my kid got into to some Tylenol, um, do I need to take him in? We'll usually base it off of uh, these amounts here. So if an adult got more than seven and a half grams, or if a child got more than 150 to 200 mg per kilo, then we go ahead and recommend they go on in and get uh, evaluated to see if they need the antidote. That we're gonna see here in a second. So um, one of the things you're gonna see, and this is a very popular nomogram, it's called the Rumac Matthew nomogram. Uh, oh, uh, let's just saying, I think on one of the Professor Q's PowerPoints said three gram max for oral Tylenol, four gram max for IV. Is four gram max uh, for both? Um, those four grams uh, typically, but I think um, some places are getting more conservative just because even for some individuals who may have like maybe subacute, you know, kidney or uh, liver injury, you may see that uh, four grams daily is going to be too much. Um, but certainly four grams has been traditionally the uh, the max oral. There, there's no difference between oral and IV. It's going to be the same regardless. So uh, I'm not sure if he's referencing something specifically, but it, it certainly may say that. Um, but for my purposes, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you four grams. Uh, but again, I would not want someone taking four grams every single day. I'd probably try to find something else we could use uh, for sure. Anyway, so we have the Rumac Matthew nomogram. This is probably one of the most popular nomograms you might use if you work in emergency medicine um, because this is going to tell you whether or not you need to treat with um, the, the antidote here, which I'm going to get into in a second. Uh, they're based off of uh, the studies done by uh, Drs. Rumac and Matthew, as you might imagine. I got to meet Dr. Rumac, so I, I don't mean to... I don't mean to, you know, uh, flex on you guys or anything, but uh, yeah, I got to meet the famous Dr. Rumac, and he's a very nice, nice gentleman. He's a pediatrician, uh, well known in, in the tox world. Um, so again, you guys can stop being impressed, okay? Jeez. Uh, regardless, though, they they based off their study, they say that if you come in, uh, see so why is this hard? Oh, so I said, um, um, if if I had a single ingestion more than seven point five grams, then that person is is more likely to develop toxicity. So that's why we go ahead and recommend they go in to to be evaluated. So if I had that history, um, if it was say someone had a single ingestion of six grams, I'm not going to be as concerned as if they say more than seven and a half. That's going to be like an automatic referral. Roll in. Uh, so what does GSH stand for? It stands for uh, glutathione, um, and that's one of the, the metabolism pathways there. So uh, that is what that refers to. Sorry about that if I was not clear. Anyway, so what we're going to do for these patients here is we're going to go ahead and do, um, uh, typically you'll you will maybe do like an initial time level, but what we're really looking for is at least a four-hour level. And basically what you'll do is you'll take that patient's acetaminophen level, you'll then plot it along this line here. And if you're above the treatment line, then you go ahead and give them the antidote, right? And this is only for like a single acute ingestion. So if someone came in and they said, oh, I ingested this stuff eight hours ago, I could look at this eight hours. I could then, if their level was say 200, I could look at the thing and say, okay, it's 200, so above the line, I'm gonna go ahead and treat, okay? Uh, and so on and so forth down here. If you check it before four hours, the nomogram is not um, uh, calibrated for that. So that's why it may seem odd that you like, you get an initial Tylenol level and as uh, maybe like two hours, and, um, you know, then we, we still tell you at the poison center, oh, go ahead and do a four-hour level. You may be like, well, why? I don't even know it's there. Well, because we don't know if it's peaked yet, right? And we need to see if they're, where they're going to fall in the nomogram in order to give it. So as an example, for that patient I was talking about um, who had the, the Tylenol PM ingestion that we gave charcoal to, we actually, we knew the time of ingestion. It was uh, pretty well um, guessed based on the parent uh, who, who didn't witness it but knew about when it happened. Um, 
So we knew the time frame. We also knew we we're going to give charcoal. So the goal for that person would be give them the charcoal within the two hours because they had the Benadryl in there as well. Uh, and then at four hours, check the level to see if she was going to be treatable or not. She ended up not being. But had she been above 150 micrograms per ml, uh, then yeah, we would have gone and treated at that four hour uh, at that time frame. And you're like, why would we even wait? Why not just treat? Well, because we're going to see that um, you know treatment may uh, it could bias an admission. We don't necessarily need. Um, we don't want to give medications unnecessarily. So I'll, I'll go over the the answer here in just a moment. In terms of monitoring and acetaminophen levels, you're looking at LFTs. And if their LFTs are bumped, then I want to probably see their PTI and R, and then check a BMP just to see if there's any like any acidosis going on or, or check their glucose and, and whatnot. There, that's kind of what we're looking for. So what do we do for these patients here? Well, ABCs, obviously. If it's just a straight Tylenol ingestion, they're probably not going to be very symptomatic at all, so this will be easy. Uh, but certainly if they're taking Lortab or anything that has uh, any kind of co-ingestions, that can cloud the picture for sure. Um, if we can do charcoal, activated charcoal is AC here, um, then we want to do that within the hour or within two hours if anticoroners or opioids are on board. Um, if they become hypoglycemic because the liver is so fried it's not producing glucose, well, then we give them some sugar, right? If they are developing a coagulopathy, not a whole lot we can do here uh, for these patients. In some cases, it may be severe enough to where we have to give vitamin K and blood products, um, like FFP, for instance. This is not common, um, but may be needed if, the, um, if they do actually have any like you know noticeable bleeding or anything like that to replace the factors their liver is not making anymore. Um, we also have criteria for potential transplants, even though I've actually never seen one. It's been reported, but you know I don't uh, see them very commonly, at least here in the U.S. But if they meet some of these criteria, and I'm not, this is called the um, the King's College criteria. I'm not going to ask you this specifically, but you can look it up if you need to. Um, if they start to manifest um, uh, some of these, then they may be uh, uh, sorry, uh, they may be uh, candidates for a liver transplant based off of this because their their chances of survival are not great. Uh, if they have, if they meet some of these criteria here. So transplant occasionally, but very, very rare that we see that. I think I've had like one case that ended up going for transplant um, due to like an accidental ingestion. So what could we do for these patients here? Well, if we know that the issue is that they're running out of um, cofactors to cause this metabolism here to happen normally to nice, safe metabolites, well, then we can replace it, right? Um, Matt's asking, do they bypass others on the transplant list due to urgency? I don't know that they get any special um, consideration there. I know that, you know, sometimes you're looking at things like, um, you know, was this an intentional ingestion or not? So again, that's why very few of these uh, typically go uh, for, for a transplant. Um, but also, we also have a pretty good uh, antidote here, which we're going to see in a minute. But uh, again, very, very rare that you run into that. So what, what I can do is basically replace what they're missing by giving a precursor to a lot of these um, uh, metabolic pathways. And so our antidote is N-acetylcysteine, otherwise known as Nucamus, or acetidote might be the other uh, name you're going to see there. And basically, this is going to serve as a glutathione precursor, so it's able to help out with that metabolism pathway. It can help to donate sulfhydryl groups, so your sulfation pathway is, help, is amped up. It also can substitute for glutathione, so that GSH I was talking about. So you can see here, it can help out with all three of these pathways in order to get rid of that NAPKE or prevent it from being formed in the first place, right? Very beneficial from that standpoint. So, um, and we actually find that no patients will die. It's about 100% effective if started within eight hours post-ingestion. So that's why we actually have some time. If we know when the ingestion occurred, if we have, you know, know it happened within a couple hours and we get that four hour level, you know, it's okay. We're not really on the rush to treat that because we know it's going to be effective if started within the eight hours, which is fantastic. Most drugs don't have that kind of, uh, uh, you know, efficacy profile. Um, we'll still get that after the fact that we can still give it late um, because it helps out with this free radical scavenging. It helps to deal with those reactive oxygen species. Um, we may have patients on it for, for quite some time. So, for instance, that guy that showed up who was like two or three days out and he's already showing up very jaundiced, we were giving him um, the N-acetylcysteine um, anyway, even though he's past that eight-hour time frame because there's still some additional benefit. Um, so, you may see NAC is another term that's maybe referred to as well. So, uh, NAC or NAC is N-acetylcysteine. Oh, because it um, substitute for or it can donate with sulfhydryl groups. There's a lot of sulfur in it, so it smells like rotten eggs. So that can, is going to be a challenge as well. We'll see here in a minute. Um, so we have two forms. We have the IV and we have the oral form. So mucamus is oral, and then we'll have uh, acetate, which is IV. Um, these can differ based off things like cost. Uh, obviously, IV is going to be more expensive, but in terms of efficacy, they both work equally well. So no issues with that, uh, and both are fairly safe. Um, really, the only big issues I worry about with orals maybe they, if they vomit because it tastes like rotten eggs. Um, with the IV, you may have some risk for allergy, but very, very rare to see that. There's a couple of different protocols we can do for these patients here. 
So for instance, the IV form, you can do a 21 hour protocol where you'd start out by giving, and I'm not gonna ask you specific doses here, but uh, you do 150 mg per kilo over an hour. Then you do a second bag that has 50 mg per kilo over four hours. And then you have a 16 hour bag, 100 mg per kilo. So a total of 21 hours. On the PO side, they're gonna do a loading dose up here in front of 140 mg per kilo. And then you have a Q4 hour dosing of 70 mg per kilo. And that's gonna be until they complete, I think it's like 21, 24 doses. I can't remember how many doses there are specifically off the top of my head, but I'll basically do it for that full 72 hours. Uh, and then at that point there, you should be good to go. The timer wall should be out of the system. LFT should be trending in the right direction. PTI and R is normalized. You're good to go. Now, in some cases, they may need a lot more than that. So that gentleman that showed up, John, just already, he was already in a very bad state. I think we had him on in acetylcysteine for maybe like five or six days of continuous administration. And eventually he did recover. He actually made a full recovery there, uh, which we did not think was going to happen. But it was uh, his, the liver is pretty wild. Um, I know some of you guys might appreciate this, but I saw a picture recently of uh, different body organs as uh, D&D &D characters, and the liver was the tank. So uh, I always think about it as being very, very nice and protective and, and very good at what it does. So again, the reason why I talk about Tylenol is because it is so common. You're going to run into it all the time. You should always keep it on the back of your mind. If you ever have an accidental or an intentional ingestion show up, like always think about Tylenol because it just does not present with any symptoms in a lot of cases there. Or if they do present with symptoms, it's usually too late um, or very late and you need to do something about it right away. So that's why I always want to go ahead and, and get that treated. So anyway, so um, let's talk about some envenomations because I still have some time to go. So uh, let's talk about uh, snakes first. Um, some of you may have a little bit of, uh, I guess it would be herpophobia, would that be it? Because it's a herpetologist if you're a reptile expert. But um, uh, anyway, so so Florida, as I mentioned, is uh, sort of the, the Australia of the U.S., I like to think. Um, and it's because we have a lot of nasty critters here that can cause some pretty significant envenomations. So um, for common Florida snakes that you run into, you have the copperheads. I'll have pictures here in a second. Uh, cottonmouths, um, you'll have the pygmy rattlesnake, eastern diamondback, and then a little bit different in a different uh, category is going to be the eastern coral snake. Yes, excited for the danger noodles for sure. Um, you'll see oftentimes the bites happen between May and October because that's when it's sort of most um, warm. And again, they're cold blooded animals. So they get very, uh, um, you know, people outside, they're active and they end up getting bit on, on accident. Ophidiophobia is correct according to Google. Interesting. I learned something new today. Fantastic. Um, Anyway, so again, the bites happen usually in the hotter months, but I, I've seen some bites happen in, in December, right? Because again, we don't get that cold here. Um, frequent victims tend to be people who are um, handlers or collectors, which again, you'll find plenty of people who like to collect snakes here in Florida. Um, children, because they're inquisitive and they may reach, uh, you know, be playing outside and things like that. And unfortunately, this is the disease of the Y chromosome. Um, you will find uh, that a lot of bites may start out with, uh, hey, look at this, uh, and you know, tend to get bit um so uh this is this is a, a challenge for our, our part of the, our gender of the the species but uh it's something hopefully we'll, we'll survive through but uh, people make a lot of bad decisions around snakes usually alcohol is involved as well as it turns out uh anyway so uh, Allison saying, do you remember a few years back when a handler's king cobra or something like that got loose i do um yes that was a black mamba actually uh, it might have been a different story because we get so, several of those uh, but maybe if I have some time, I'll tell you the black mamba story uh, at some point. But um, regardless, so here's an example of a pig, uh, pygmy rattlesnake. These guys are fairly small, but they're kind of aggressive. Uh, again, if you hear the rattle, that's not a good sign, but they might not always have that. They've shed uh, recently here. Um, I'll talk about sort of the anatomy of the snake that lets you kind of know whether or not it's going to be uh, venomous or not, right? So here's an example of a pygmy rattlesnake. Here's a copperhead. There's actually two different snakes. It's not a double-ended snake or a double-headed snake. Um, these are not super concerned in terms of envenomation. Um, I've seen some people that don't even like to give these guys um, uh, give these guys anti-venom, as we'll see here in just a little bit, but they're usually pretty low on my, my uh, spectrum of, of danger. Um, here's a cottonmouth or water moccasin. They do like uh, bodies of water, lakes and ponds and things like that. They call them cottonmouths because they have a nice white mouth there. Well, I said a handler got bitten at San Diego Zoo last week. There's no anti-venom for the particular bite he got. Oh, I wonder what kind of snake it was. I don't know. Interesting. Um, here's the Eastern Diamondback. These guys are nasty. I don't see these too, too frequently. Most of the bites I see are usually from like pygmy rattlesnakes and, uh, water moccasins and whatnot. But yeah, if you get an Eastern Diamondback, those can be very nasty. These are big snakes. They have a lot of venom and they can be very difficult to treat. 
um, as we'll see here in just a little bit. Um, so we call these snakes, they fit into the family Crotalidae. Um, and so they are also known as pit vipers as another name for those. Notice I haven't talked about the, the coral snake yet. That fits into a whole other family. Some of the things you're going to be looking for when you see uh, Africa bush viper. I thought we had something for a bush viper. There's, uh, there's, we have like antivenom resources we go and look up. But yeah, it's uh, interesting. Yeah, hopefully he did okay. Um, but anyway, so with Crotalidae or the pit vipers here, you can tell they're pretty obvious to tell, right? Um, for one, they're going to have a triangular shaped head. Right, so they should have you know a fairly thin neck, but a big triangular shaped head. Um, they will have these elliptical pupils, kind of like cat's eyes a little bit there. Um, if you see two big hypodermic needles sticking out of their mouth, it's probably a pit viper, um, or at least in Florida, it's a, like a natural, naturally occurring snake. It's probably a pit viper. Uh, they may have the rattle, um, and again, as I mentioned, the hinge fangs, and they even the anal plates are a little bit different too. So this is handy because if you have a patient who um, got bit, but say they like decapitated the snake and they brought the body in, you can't really tell if the coloring pattern always, but you can sometimes look at the anal plates here and tell. So for instance, if it is a uh, venomous snake here, you're only going to see a single row versus it can be a double row here uh, for these um, uh the non-venomous snakes as an example here. So again, single row versus a double row. Uh, again, I don't recommend getting close enough a snake to look at his butt to tell if it's uh, venomous or not, but it has been done in the past uh, if, if the head has been removed. Um, so things we're going to be looking at as well in terms of like the bite characteristics or like kind of where it's happened. Um, usually you're going to see in a lot of cases it's going to be like to the hands of people who are trying to handle the snakes, uh, but it could be if they're just walking, it might be, you know, to the lower extremities there. Uh, got to be a wildlife biologist as well as a PA. Sometimes it's helpful, right, uh, to be able to kind of recognize these things. Um, because, again, uh, you know, think about it too. Everyone's got a, a camera in their pocket for the most part. Um, so now they can take pictures. I, they'll say, do I need to bring the snake in? I killed it. I was like, no, don't bring the snake in. I don't want to hear. Um, there you go. So I have a handy saying for that in just a little bit, uh, Paige. Uh, but anyway, so uh, things to consider are going to be like the number of strikes um uh, that that actually occurred uh the venom status of the snake so sometimes you'll get maybe about like a quarter of the time they get what they call dry bites where the snake bit the patient but they actually had no venom uh injected and thus they can have uh, other than the, the local injury basically no issues there which can be uh handy if that happens um sometimes the size of the snake matters and then obviously location is uh, going to make a difference in terms of like you know what kind of um uh, where, where it is being affected um you may even think things like you know uh having um you know bites to the face is is rare but honestly i've seen people try to take selfies with these snakes and then get bitten right it's like why 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 do you do this you know it's like natural selection and in, in, in play here and we got to bring them back from the brink of death sometimes you know but anyway so what happens with these, um, these, uh, why is this such a problem, right? Why do we care about this? Well, basically they have all these different, um, substances they're injecting into this patient, um, where they have things like, you know, proteolytic enzymes there's pro anticoagulants, even cardiotoxins in some cases, and it causes a lot of direct tissue damage, right? So when you're looking at this, you can see here, um, there's going to be a lot of swelling. There's going to be bullae that are forming here, a ton of ecchymosis, a lot of swelling, right? And sometimes you're going to see, um, you know, uh, uh, one limb will be twice the size of the other. They get so severely swollen uh, from this uh, envenomation. Yeah, just call them neat from a distance. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the other big thing, so not only do you see local tissue injury, but you're also going to see systemic uh, risk for uh, cardi uh, uh, coagulopathies, right? So we can see things where, like, you know, they develop a, um, a fiber hypofibrogenemia, so that low fiber antigen levels, the PTINR will be up, APTT will be up, all of that, and bleeding is a potential risk here, right? In some cases, you may find um, some even have um, issues that can cause uh, some, some nerve damage as well, but really it's the, the coagulopathies and the swelling and the tissue damage that we're really concerned about here. Um, again, kind of local versus systemic. All of it depends on where do they get bit, how big of a dose do they get. So again, the course can be pretty variable. Sometimes they just get limb swelling and some ecchymosis and a lot of pain, uh, but they may not get a lot of systemic issues. Really just depends on, on the situation there. So as I mentioned, local reactions, very painful swelling. This can be, um, again, it's going to look painful, and it will be very painful for them. Uh, Paresthesias, uh, ecchymosis, blistering, all this good stuff. In some cases, you can even see things like rhabdo, which is pretty rare, but it's a, there's a type of uh, rarely seen snake in Florida. It's called canebrake rattlesnake or timber rattlesnake um, that can cause rhabdo, or it's been known to. Um, and in general, you're going to see that the rattlesnakes are going to be more... Um, uh, 
more symptomatic than your moccasins, which would be more symptomatic than your copperheads. Copperheads are kind of like the wimpiest out of the bunch, whereas like your big eastern diamondbacks are going to be like pretty, pretty nasty. Okay. Um, now, in terms of systemic reactions, again, fear, anxiety, and pain, right? That's going to be pretty common there. So patients may be pretty freaked out. They just got bit by a snake. Um, you know, you can see things like nausea, vomiting, tachycardia related to this. So again, sometimes treating their anxiety is going to be really a big component of this as well. Uh, occasionally, you may see things like renal failure. I mentioned the hematologic toxicity you can see there. And even again, some may have neurotoxic uh, effects, right? That's actually the Mojave rattlesnake that can do that, which you usually see out west, but uh, you never know. Someone might be a handler and have one here. So what do we do for these patients, right? I oftentimes tell people that um, the best uh, treatment for a snake bite is a, a set of car keys. Uh, and someone asked, um, they said, uh, what do you like? Do you rub the car keys on, on the wound? And I said, no, you, you put them in your car so you can go to the ER and, and get evaluated. Um, because people have a tendency to do uh, silly things that aren't really going to be that effective. But I think like just societally, they've gotten this idea in their head of what they should do. So for instance, they were like, put a tourniquet on to prevent the spread. This actually worsens things because now you're depriving this limb of oxygen, which is going to cause even worse in tissue damage, right? Um, we don't recommend they suck or cut out the venom because that can also cause um, further damage. I mean, it's just not going to be that effective. I mean, I guess you can test your friendship with someone to see if they're going to suck out the venom, um, but it's, it's not going to do you a whole lot of good, right? Um, so what we do is have them come in, get evaluated to see if it's going to be a dry bite or if it's something we actually need to treat. Sometimes these things may take hours before they really become symptomatic. Um, so typically we watch them for about eight to 12 hours. If they remain asymptomatic, besides just a little bit of local swelling due to the bite, then we let them go. Otherwise, if they start to develop significant swelling or any signs of coagulopathy, we're gonna treat with the anti-venom. I'll tell you that in just a moment, a moment here. Um, other things to assess for as well include tetanus status. We may update that. Um, check for allergies to anything if they've, um, and if they've ever gotten anti-venom before. Because I'll tell you, one of the risk factors for getting bit by a snake is being previously bitten by a snake because typically they have bad behaviors that get them bitten a second time, uh, especially for adult males. Um, so that's good to know if they have any bad reactions to it. Uh, let's see, uh, Brian uh, says, back in the day they had this song called Tarantella, uh, which people would dance to after being bit by a tarantula. Little do they know, it kills them faster. Interesting, yeah, I mean, spreading the, uh, the, the venom even faster, perhaps. Although tarantulas aren't normally known to be, uh, maybe it's a specific type of tarantula. I don't know them to normally be all that problematic from a uh, envenomation standpoint. Let's see. Uh, Kelly's saying, uh, having Steve Irwin flashbacks from all the times he was bit while being in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, it's uh, not not great. Uh, there's a, there's a, a um, serpentarium here in St. Cloud if you're ever in the area. I'm sure they probably don't have uh, strict COVID uh, restrictions there, but um, um, the, one of the guys there is pretty famous for a lot of his uh, envenomations he's had. It's actually a really cool serpentarium. They have like a lot of really cool snakes, um, but he's um, had, had plenty of bites, and you can tell just go by his hand disfiguration he has. He has, has some pretty uh, bad joint destruction things going on uh, from that. Yeah, poor Steve Irwin. Uh, anyway, so we'll talk about um, uh, uh, stingrays here in just a little bit, actually. Um, anyway, so again, in, in treat the pain and anxiety, usually some benzos, uh, definitely, uh, you know, copious amounts of opioids may be necessary because the pain is so, so severe with this here. So what do we like to do for these patients here? Um, we like to do measurements. So we'll do that circumferentri circumferentially. I was trying to say that without tripping over it. Uh, so basically measuring kind of the, the girth of the limb to see if it's expanding out. We'll also measure sort of the, the leading line of, of, um, uh, of the swelling to see how far it's progressing, right? So in, in one of my cut points to treat is actually to make, uh, say if it crosses like a major joint. So like they got bit on the hand and the swelling is starting to progress up the forearm, I might go ahead and pull the trigger to treat with antivenom. Uh, and then we're also going to be measuring um, or doing our, our labs in terms of looking at their uh, clotting um, uh, studies, right? So we're going to be looking at like P platelets, PTINR, PTT, and fibrinogen. The other thing I forgot to mention is you can see hypo uh, therm or, uh, thermocytopenia uh, associated with that. So we'll do that usually initially. It'll follow up every six hours or so to see how that's progressing. Um, now, some people, and again, I always t I always um, try to keep surgeons from uh, getting involved with snake bite patients because their um, first thing they think about doing is, is to do a fasciotomy for these patients because, again, the limbs look so swollen. Oftentimes, that just leads to uh, a lot of disfigurement and, and pain for the patient. Um, oftentimes, the best treatment is going to be the antivenom, as we're going to see here in just a moment. Um, some cases, you may have to do things like digitotomies where because uh, the finger can't really handle that much pressure without causing nerve nerve damage. So I've seen that occasionally, but I try to not do fasciotomies. There's some you know guidelines out there that also recommends against that from like an ortho standpoint. They're like, please don't do fasciotomies for these patients. They don't need it. Uh, and then occasionally we may do blood products, um, if, but that's rare that we need that. Usually antivenom is going to be the, the way to do it. 
So the main uh, thing we're going to do here is uh, anti-venom. So basically, uh, we have two varieties now. I think I, I don't have the other one on here. Actually, no, I do have the new one, uh, one on here that's so available. So we have two. We have Crofab and then we have Anavip. They're a little bit different um, from what they are. But basically, with Crofab, it is an ovine-derived, so sheep-based um, uh, antibody that has been sensitized. So they took a sheep, gave it small amounts of this venom to produce antibodies against a wide variety of different uh, pit vipers. This includes Western Diamondback, Eastern Diamondback, things like that. And fortunately, with um, with pit vipers, there's enough cross coverage to where they will treat just about any um, pit viper in North America, which is handy because, again, even if it's um, something that's not on this list here, there's still enough cross reactivity to where it works. And so notice, like, the copperhead's not on here, but it still works for copperhead and venomations because it is very similar in terms of the, the venom. And so what we do this for, we'll give it um, in cases of they have progressive swelling, coagulopathy, or any sort of like hemodynamic or neuromuscular compromise. Those are sort of our indications to do so. And this is one of the biggest questions I get during the summertime is docs calling up or uh, PAs or MPs calling up from the ER saying, hey, do I need to give antivenom? Because this stuff is expensive. It's about, um, I'm trying to think, $3,600 per vial. And you may be giving like between, you know, 10 to 30 vials for a patient also when everything is said and done. Uh, so it can be quite, quite expensive there, as, you, as you'll see. Someone said, why would you wait to administer antivenom? So um, a lot of that is because, one, we need to see if we even need to give it in the first place. Sorry, I have something in my eye. Um, so, you know, do we even need to give the antivenom in the first place? So um, if they don't need it, then obviously you don't want to give it because it's very expensive. Um, and and uh, you don't want to give this drug unnecessarily. It could cause allergic reactions potentially. So, yeah. So uh, if it's a dry bite, we'll wait and see if they remain asymptomatic and we don't need to give anything. However, sometimes this stuff can be delayed. So you don't want to just um, automatically treat it because otherwise, um, you know, it, you don't, just don't, you'll never know if it's a dry bite. And then you're kind of committing the patient to, to being on it, unfortunately. So... Um, and again, I expect you to know all of the, the actual scientific names for these snakes here. I'm just kidding. You also know this. Um, just know that it works for any of the North American pit vipers. Okay. Now, if you get something from a different country or a different continent, you might not be uh, having so much luck as we'll see here in just a little bit. Um, so seeing here, we're going to give them like a usual uh, bolus up front, about four to six vials to try to get the swelling and the coagulopathy under control. We'll give that over about an hour or so. Uh, and then we can um, uh, draw coags afterwards to make sure that things are kind of going in the right direction. But again, sometimes you'll see patients who will have you know, drops in their platelets, sometimes 18, 24 hours out um, because you know have like a little pocket of venom that eventually got absorbed uh, more slowly than the rest of it. And then we'll typically do a maintenance dosing. So they get about 24 hours of coverage on average, assuming everything goes well for them. Uh, and then we'll monitor them for about another 24 hours, make sure there's no recurrence of symptoms, and then they're good to go, right? Um, now there's a newer one out as well. And so with Crofab, it's a, you know, a, basically you're going to see that it's just the fab portion of the, the antibody. So the reason why we have to give so many doses is because it is uh, a shorter bit and it gets cleared from the body more quickly here. Um, what you're going to see though is that, and again, if you look at the whole antibody here, this is what um, uh, Crofab would look like. It's just that little tiny portion of it that's able to neutralize the venom. Um, but we're going to see that there's another product now out called Anavip, which is the, it's called a Fab 2 uh, fragment. So again, you get the two FAB portions here. And this has a lot longer half-life. So this is the new product that's out on the market now. It's nice. It's just like a one-time dose. Um, so depending on which one the hospital has, we may use one versus the other. So it's kind of handy from that standpoint. Okay. Uh, someone said, I apologize if this has been asked already, but uh, being slightly behind. And I often see the extra strength 500 milligram Tylenol dose being used a lot. Would you say that it's appropriate or, or considered toxic since the daily max should be 400 milligrams? Well, the, the daily max is 4,000 milligrams, right? Um, so you could do potentially up to like eight of those uh, 500. Now, again, I would not recommend that every single day because over time that can sort of um, uh, can cause damage. And I've seen plenty of uh, sort of chronic sort of hepatic uh, injury done due to, uh, you know, therapeutic doses of Tylenol especially in anyone with a uh, you know, hepatic disease. So it's something I would definitely um, uh, not recommend doing every single day. But yeah, 4,000 milligrams, not 400. Okay. Um, any th other things too, um, you're going to see here with uh, the anti it doesn't stop the swelling. It doesn't really reverse it. It, just, um, it does stop the swelling. It does not reverse it. So um, this prevents it from getting any worse. But some people think you give it and all of a sudden the limb is going to go down to normal size. It, it doesn't. Um, and again, if a patient does have anaphylaxis, but have a true, like a really a bad envenomation, you may have to treat through that occasionally. So things like Epi and Benadryl and steroids and all that being given as well. Um, typically we'll have them follow up with their PCP to see if they have any coagulopathy that developed after the fact, you know, so, uh, we'd have them, you know, don't participate in any 
you know, full contact sports or anything for a little bit because your bleeding risk might be a little bit higher. Uh, and definitely let them know if they've received antivenom before because they may be sensitized and have a reaction to it the next time they get it. So just one thing to note with that. Um, some people get what they call serum sickness, and this can happen with um, really any antibody that you give, but it's basically an immune reaction to that antibody. And it's kind of like probably what some of you are feeling after like your second COVID shot. You get kind of the muscle aches and uh, malaise and, and, and uh, fatigue and all of that. You just treat it with Tylenol and it's generally fine for the most part. So um, let me use the last couple of minutes here because this one's pretty short. So um, next are going to be the eastern coral snakes. Here's an eastern coral snake. Here's a non-venomous scarlet king snake. And these are a lot different because um, basically they have a totally different type of, uh, of venom they have. And so um, the way you can identify an eastern coral snake, right, is the red on yellow, kill a fellow, red on black, venom lack. So if you see here, if you look at the body of the snake, red touches yellow, that is an eastern coral snake. You see here red on black, that is a non-venomous snake here. Now this only applies to North America. If you go to other places where in this, uh, you know, the other one that fell into the category of Crotalidae, these are called Elapidae. And so there's a lot of Elapidae that are over in places like in Asia and you'll kind of have all kinds of colors there. It will not hold true for this. But again, if they go traveling and they see red on black, they may not be safe, okay? I always say red on yellow, run away, red on black, run away. And then you're fine, you don't have to worry about it. But these are pretty uh, prominent here in Florida. We are like the qu coral snake capital of uh, of the U.S. Um, the other things that are different with them is you notice they don't have uh, the triangular shaped head. They don't have the elliptical pupils. So they don't have those telltale signs like you see with a rattlesnake, right? Um, however, the color banding pattern is important here. Uh, but they also have really small fangs, right? So when they bite, they don't really inject you like you would see with the pit viper, they have to kind of sit there and chew on you before they can really inject the venom. So one of the big things we always like to hear in the story that whether we think there's going to be a true envenomation is did the snake hold on or did you have to like rip it off of you? Sometimes they'll say it sounds like Velcro and they rip it off uh, because this thing will sit there and bite, uh, chew on you. Now these guys are pretty reclusive. Like they don't really want to bite people because it's not looking at you like your meal. Um, but I'll tell you, I had a, a one case of this um, guy who was uh, life flighted into us. He ended up getting uh, uh, the antivenom and everything. I said, I can't get bitten by a wild snake if you don't leave the house. Uh, very good, exactly. So let's all be hermits now. Um, but uh, so anyway, so this guy got life flighted into us from uh, somewhere in Georgia, I think, and he got treated after after having a coral snake bite. Um, and he ended up becoming pretty symptomatic and needed the anti-venom. Um, but uh, I was asking him about the story. I said, this is what was happening. And again, I'm going to use my... Um, uh, my, my gift for storytelling and, and using my accents here. And so I said, oh, well, you know, what what led up to the bite there? He's like, well, I was out in the woods, as I usually am, and uh, I found this little this little colorful fella uh, on the ground there. So I picked him up, and the little guy bit me. I said, oh, well, that sounds terrible. Uh, did he hold on? He's like, no, it fell right off. And I said, okay, well, that, that's weird. It doesn't sound like he actually envenomated you. And he goes, well, and then I picked him up a second time. And I said, oh, okay, you picked him a second time. I was like, did he hold on then? He goes, nope, little sucker fell right off. I said, okay. And he goes, but the third time he really bit me and oh, he got me that time. I had to rip him right off. Um, so, I, you know, I said, well, you know, the snake gave you a, a couple of tries there. I think, it, it, you know, probably not his fault. And so, uh, yeah, <laughs> very funny, very story to, uh, to tell. Uh, Matthew says, that's not true. There was a show I saw where this lady had snakes in her walls and they come out of the vents. Okay, please don't uh, give everyone uh, uh, rational nightmares, Matthew. Jeez. Yeah. So um, again, this is a disease of the Y chromosome, unfortunately, uh, when it comes to adults. Uh, but anyway, so the venom is a lot different here. You don't really see any swelling. You don't really see any sort of coagulopathies. This is mainly neurotoxic. And you'll see this a lot, especially like with like cobras, um, like bush vipers, all kinds of things. They're, they're more neurotoxic in nature, like uh, mambas and things like that. So they kind of work like our neuromuscular blockers. They actually work to block acetylcholine receptors at the uh, uh, nicotinic receptor. Um, they block them on the neuromuscular junction, so it actually causes a flaccid paralysis. So the thing that will kill you if you don't get the antivenom, if you have a true envenomation, is this diaphragmatic paralysis and you stop breathing, right? It's respiratory failure, basically. And it can take some time to kick in. Like, and, and again, sometimes we don't even know if it's a dry bite for more than, say, 24 hours because of the slow-acting nature of, of the uh, envenomation. Some people get symptomatic really soon. Some people it takes a while. And so that's why it's really important to do good monitoring. And if we hear things like, hey, the, the snake held on, had to be pulled off, we think a lot more heavily about this being a true envenomation because typically they just do defensive strikes and it's not going to be a problem most of the time. 
But uh, things we can see here include things like paresthesia, ptosis, uh, slurred speech. Uh, but again, that respiratory paralysis is the big thing that I'm worried about. And this, the effects can be prolonged, right? So if you can get the antivenom done early, then you can stop a lot of this from happening. But if you end up waiting too late or the patient uh, wait, you know, waits to present, that can be a problem. But it should be fully reversible with time. Um, I did my, a lot of my research uh, in uh, specifically uh, coral snake bites in my fellowship. And uh, the average time for someone that got intubated due to a coral snake bite was eight days. So it's quite a bit of time to be on the ventilator uh, for something like a snake bite, you know. Uh, so anyway, so what do we do for these patients? We typically will observe them from 24 hours after they show up in the ED. Usually this will be on the floor somewhere doing good neuro checks. Again, don't cut, suck, constrict the limb, anything like that because it's not going to help you out. Just get to the ER, right? I had one time a guy called up and said, hey, I'm down by the river and I got bit by a snake. And I said, okay, well, you know, I think you should go into the hospital. Uh, you know, do you want us to call 911 for you? He's like, no, I can drive myself. It don't hurt too bad. Um, I said, well, how long is it going to take you to get back to your car? He's like, oh, it's about four miles or so. And I was like, hold on, we're calling 911 because, like, you know, you can't wait that long for this stuff. Um, anyway, check for tetanus status. Um, uh, check for uh, actually, this is my this is my accent. Uh, this is my fake accent. The the other one is is the real one, but I don't show you guys that unless I have a good reason to. Uh, no, he was not. Uh, he was not living in a van down by the river. Uh, he was not Matt. What's his name? Matt something. I can't remember his name now, but Chris Farley. Um, anyway, so again, if there's any pain, anxiety, go ahead and, and uh, uh, see if I if I talk like that all the time in my natural accent, then you wouldn't have any credibility. You wouldn't think I actually knew anything. You think I'm just some bumpkin from uh, from Interlock in Florida, which which I am. Um, Anyway, note here, we also don't do like prophylactic antibiotics for any of these, like you would say for like a dog bite or something. Typically, just good wound care is, is enough to, to make sure um, that uh, the patients are not going to have any problems with infection. But I do, uh, sometimes you can see secondary like MRSA infections. Uh, again, just good wound care prevents a lot of that. You're going to be doing pretty frequent uh, neuro checks there. So we have an antivenom that we can use, and I apologize if I go over a few minutes here, but I'm trying to finish up. Um, this one we don't, we used to not make for a while there. Um, uh, now it is available again, but it, it was out of production. So we're actually having to use um, expired drug for a lot of patients, which is not great, uh, but it is kind of what we had available. And so we were giving expired drug. The FDA would come in and test it every every year to make sure we could still use it. Um, and uh, this one was actually the full equine antibody. I mean, it come, comes from a horse. Uh, and it's a full antibody, meaning it's a lot more likely causing anaphylaxis. And that is something we'd see. I had a lot of people develop reactions to this, and we'd have to treat them with steroids and Benadryl and sometimes Epi just to get the antivenom in them, unfortunately. Uh, and we give them between three and five vials, depending on how symptomatic they are. And typically it has a nice long half-life because it is the full antibody, and they don't have any issues there. But we do see a lot of serum sickness afterwards. Um, so, again, it's something to warn the patient about once they end up going home there. So this is called the, the North American Coral Snake Antivenom. That's what we use primarily. Okay, so that's it I'm going to cover for today. So someone said, so with pit vipers, it's okay to watch and wait, but with coral snakes, get the antivenom as soon as possible. That's a great question. Well, that's actually the, the basis of my research back in the day. Um, so what we wanted to find out was, was because the stuff was all expired, it was, not, it was no longer being made. Once we ran out of coral snake antivenom, there's nothing left to give the patients. You'd just be screwed. So we adopted a watch and wait approach to see if patients did become symptomatic, then we went ahead and gave it. The old mantra was if you heard that the snake had like held on to the patient, had to be pulled off, you'd automatically go ahead and give the antivenom because you're worried about the outcomes. So my research, what I did was actually look to see um, which approach led to worse outcomes. If watching and waiting led to worse patient outcomes than giving it automatically. And what we found was actually was safer because one, you could still identify those patients that needed it fairly early with like minor uh, complications, you know, like paresthesias, go ahead and give it. And then they don't need to be on the vent probably. Um, but they also had a lot less anaphylaxis happen there. So that's kind of what my research was all based on. So that kind of changed how we, how we practice here in Florida uh, because this is where we get most of the bites. Uh, someone said, how long does antivenom usually last? I know in certain regions, snake bites are more common, but I feel like it's the type of thing we would sit around waiting to be used in a lot of places. Um, yeah, you're right. And a lot of places might not have uh, much stock. So for instance, like, you know, um, I did a, a rotation up in, in Syracuse, New York, and they don't really stock a lot of antivenom because they never have bites that happen. Or if they do, everyone freaks out because they're like, what do we do? This is a snake bite. We don't have any antivenom. And, and um, you know, they get very excitable versus down here. If you see like an Eastern Coral or uh, Eastern Diamondback bite, you're just like, cool. All right, let's, you know, let's get the Crofab out or Anavip or whatever. So a lot of it is regional depending on where you're working at. Like in Hawaii, like there's probably no Crofab because 
there's no snakes in Hawaii uh, naturally uh, living there. Um, you know, things like that. But um, yeah, so it just depends. A lot of times we have these drugs on what we call consignment, meaning that we don't pay for them until we actually use them. Um, and so that's like a deal we work out with the companies. And so you'll see that in a lot of hospitals. Um, yeah, so that's that's how we do that. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is tomorrow I'm going to wrap up the section here of a couple more creepy crawlers to talk about, some, uh, some aquatic envenomations. We'll then do our review. Uh, and again, I'll be doing this uh, live in class. So if you'd like to come, you can sign up on the sign up sheet that's available. So we'll be doing the blend flex. Uh, and then we will be uh, good to go. We should be finished up for the exam for Monday. And then you will be done with pharmacology too. Pretty cool stuff, I think. Uh, it's been a wild year, but here we are. So any questions I can answer for you before I let you go to whatever your next class is. I wish we could find that picture of congestion any questions at all yeah you guys have a great rest of your day i'll try to find some some interesting tox pictures i'll show that tomorrow if i can i'll go through my my archives all right all right you guys have a great day i will see you all later